So this is my pleasure to have uh, Emmanuel Rachelson. Uh, so among the main organizers of the school, as you could already see. So Emmanuel is a professor in machine learning and optimization at uh, Isae Supero and is also an NET researcher and he leads the Supero reinforcement and reinforcement learning initiative. Uh, Emmanuel has also uh, um, contributed a lot to making this uh, this uh, reinforcement le learning school uh, a success. So Manu, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Sebastian. Thanks a lot for that very kind introduction. So good morning again, everybody. Um, so I have the pleasure and the honor to be giving this first talk of our LBS. And my goal for this three hours class, and I'll reassure you right away, we will have breaks and pauses along the way. Uh, my goal for this three hours class is actually to take you all into a walk in the garden of reinforcement learning so that everybody becomes familiar with the notions, the ways of thinking, the vocabulary, the main, um, the main animals that we will actually encounter in this garden. Some of them will be fairly mathematical, some of them will be algorithmic, um, my goal is for you by the end of the session to actually have a general grasp of the vocabulary and the main concepts that we will encounter all throughout the, the virtual school. Uh, a short forward before we start diving into the, the topic of reinforcement learning fundamentals. Um, this class is all centered on a single notebook, the one that you can see on your screen right now. And I will actually unfold this notebook all along the way with you. So you are strongly encouraged to download that notebook, which is available on the class page, uh, especially because inside the notebooks, you have links to external polls um, that uh, will allow us to interact together. It is a deliberate choice not to have slides or presentations. I think having something that moves in a fluid way uh, where you can actually see things moving is sometimes beneficial for learning. This is why I decided not to, to have slides. And the way this is going to work is we are going to go through a certain number of concepts and ideas with short exercises along the way, some of them through polls, some of them through um, you doing the exercise on your own. I, I will leave you some time for that. A little bit of live coding or of code commenting and two class breaks for you to breathe uh, approximately one hour from now and two hours from now. What you should expect uh, in terms of contents is some plain word notions, a decent amount of them, but I will avoid at all costs oversimplification because the goal is actually for you to actually get to grasp the main concepts and the main vocabulary and all the ideas. And so oversimplifying would actually serve no good there. And uh, also a fair amount of hopefully painless, rigorous notations and abstract concepts, again, for the same reason, so that you start the reinforcement learning virtual school with um, good and solid bases and fundamentals. Also, you will see that most things in the notebook will actually be fully written down. Um, the reason there is to increase your autonomy in replaying the notebook in case you want to replay it at some point and you don't have a lecturer to, to take you through it. Throughout the notebook, key results are all in green boxes, exercises in yellow boxes, and solutions in red boxes. And here comes the first yellow box. Uh, here are the prerequisites, which I suppose everybody has for this class. I suppose everybody knows about basic algebra, so vectors, matrices, vector spaces, uh, so really basic algebra and notions about random variables and probability distributions. These are the strict prerequisites. Um, useful but not compulsory are the notions of random processes, Markov chains, the notion of contraction mapping, and I should add, and probably forgot to put it in the notebook, 
the notions linked to optimization, such as gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, or stochastic approximation. If you're not really familiar with all that, I will take you through it. It's useful, but not compulsory. So here is the outline of this class, which you can always see on the side here, um, but we'll just detail it quickly now. I will start by stating the class goals. I've already started doing this, but uh, we will make it a little clearer. And then I will definitely spoil all the fun and ruin the suspense with a general abstract definition of reinforcement learning and what reinforcement learning is concerned with. Of course, this abstract, abstract definition, I will try to illustrate it with examples and try to make it very concrete for everybody. This will lead us to the question of situating the field of reinforcement learning within machine learning. And then this being done, we will try to move from plain words descriptions to our first variables and towards modeling, which will lead us to the first big part of this notebook, which is part five, which is about modeling sequential decision problems with Markov decision processes. And from there, we will move our way towards the question of solving the reinforcement learning problem through part six, seven, and eight. The conclusion of this notebook will be a general summary of everything we've seen, um, a, a specific taxonomy of challenges intrinsic to reinforcement learning and how these challenges and these concepts relate to specific RLVS classes and specific parts that might not be covered in RLVS. So let's go. Uh, well, sorry, uh, just one thing. I will look at the Zoom Q&A when we take breaks. So we will take a break after section five, another break after section six. And so while I'm talking, it's pretty hard for me to look at the Q&As. And so we, I will try to take questions um, either from Sebastian or from the Zoom Q&A during the breaks or a little bit before the breaks. So let's start. My goal during this class is for you to acquire the fundamental building blocks of RL. And those blocks are notional. So it's, um, it's acquiring the vocabulary, obtaining plain word notions. Some of those blocks are algorithmic, uh, which means designing algorithms and being able to code them. Some of those blocks are mathematical uh, in terms of models, variables, notations. So by the end of this class, I'd like you to be familiar and confident in manipulating the notion of MDPs, Markov decision processes, policies, optimality equations, etc. Uh, we will have some common notations. Maybe some of the speakers later on will not use the exact same notations, but at least you will be able to make a link quickly. We will have gone through a couple of key algorithms. And by the way, on the way uh, there, we will have debunked a couple of common misconceptions about reinforcement learning or in the way we generally present reinforcement learning. And in the end, in the conclusion, we'll see about key challenges in reinforcement learning and their connection to the RLVS lectures. So as I promised, I'm going to start by ruining the suspense with a general abstract definition. The question we want to answer is, what is reinforcement learning about? And a straightforward answer is, it is about learning to control dynamic systems, just as exemplified in this quite abstract drawing, where um, a system which is described at a certain time step by its internal state uh, will change over the course of time over different time steps. So we're in a discrete time step uh, framework. At every time step, uh, the system issues an observation that is fed to a control function or control policy, which we'll, we will write pi along the way. And this control function or control policy decides on an action or command, A or U, that we will input to the system that will change the state of the system and the process will repeat. So we talk about learning to control dynamic systems. So why do we say dynamic? Because we talk about the evolution of S, the states, and O, the observation, under the control of a behavior, a policy, a control function pi over a certain time horizon. And so our object of study in reinforcement learning is to find a control policy pi such that the system sigma behaves as we desire. So obviously this definition is abstract and very dry. We don't really have much um, 
intuition behind this definition. And so now that I've laid this down because I didn't want to be beating around the bush, um, talking about examples and moving across intuitions, we have this definition now, and we are going to relate it to example of reinforcement learnings. And I will voluntarily not start with the most common examples you might find everywhere on the web, and we'll move to those a bit later. So let's take a couple of examples uh, and try to identify where the dynamic system is, uh, what is the control function or control policy, what are the observations and what are the states. For example, suppose you are a plane pilot and your plane has entered a spiral. Spiral is a rather dangerous uh, situation for the plane that can lead to a crash and exiting a spiral is a maneuver that uh, is taught to many pilots because that's a safety maneuver. So exiting a spiral actually requires inputting a series of commands on the plane's actuators so that the plane actually exits the spiral. So a spiral is kind of a stall. Uh, so this is a problem of control of a dynamical system where the dynamical system is the, is the, the plane and the sequence of inputs that are given to the plane are those commands that we will input. Another system that we want, might want to control is the, um, the uh, dynamic treatment regime for immunodepressed patients. In this case, uh, we want to input commands that are the prescription of the physician and the state of the system to control is actually the immune system of the patient. This is also a system that evolves over several time steps, uh, just as the plane was. Balancing a pole that is hanging from a cart where only the cart is actuated and trying to swing the pole upwards um, is also a system that falls into this category. And then queuing problems where you open welcome desk or you close them in airports so as to control the congestion is also a similar kind of problem. Portfolio management in finance also falls into that category. Hydroelectric production, where you decide on which power plant to actually turn on and off uh, to answer the global electricity demand. All those are problems with a temporal dynamics and the need for a, a control policy to actually input commands to the system so that the global system behaves in the way that we desire. So those are generally uncommon examples, but you have um, some examples that are way more, um, more famous like elevator scheduling via reinforcement learning, bicycle riding, ship steering, bioreactor control, aerobatics helicopter control, airports departure scheduling, ecosystem regulation and preservation, Robocop soaker, video game playing, I'm sure you've heard about at least playing Atari with reinforcement learning, and obviously the probably the most well-known of all, learning to play video, uh, sorry, learning to play board games, and especially learning to play Go. So what all these systems have in common is that abstract definition we gave at the beginning. So learning to play a board game, learning to juggle, learning to take good strategic decisions, learning to drive a car, all fall into the same category of control problems. And reinforcement learning studies the process of elaborating a good control strategy through interaction samples, through interaction with the system. So here comes our first green box of the class. Reinforcement learning is about learning an optimal sequential behavior in a given environment. Let's break the words down here a little bit because these words are going to come back recurrently all through um, your life as reinforcement learning researchers. So sequential behavior in a given environment. This implicitly supposes the existence of discrete time steps and that we will have a behavior that decides on a sequence of actions. So all these are important keywords for us. We want this sequential behavior to be optimal, which means that we will have to compare uh, behaviors to uh, altogether, uh, which also means that a reward signal will inform us of the quality of the last action we've taken. And overall, what are, we are interested in is not the quality of the last action, is the overall quality of the behavior. 
And finally, uh, we don't just want to find that optimal behavior, we want to learn it. And by learning, we mean that we want to avoid a modeling step of the system and a calculus step where we actually derive an optimal controller. Instead, we would like to rely on interaction samples, on experience of interacting with the environment, uh, with the dynamic system, and so as to perform behavior adaptation on the control function, the control policy. So the keywords I would like you to really remember at this point in the notebook uh, are system to control, which is generally a synonym for environment, control policy, which will be our object of study, our key object of study, and optimality, the fact that some behaviors, some control policies are actually better than others and that we, sh we should be able to uh, compare them together. Obviously, if you, if you have remembered more keywords than those three bullet points, that's perfect. But those three ones are the, the key ones. And here goes the first poll of the day. This is just a warm up. Um, so if I click on the poll, it takes me to, well, apparently, yeah, it takes me to uh, a screen there. So I strongly encourage you to, uh, to take a look at the poll on my dashboard here, which you can see, I can actually take a look at the results. And so I will leave you uh, say 30 seconds from now because the question is really easy to uh, give me a couple of answers there. And, and we will get back to the class just after that. I will display the results of the polls as they go. And from the polls, you can always uh, check the results on you, yourself. So yeah, Emine, there are some uh, already some questions. Sure. Um, so there, there is a, uh, a quite general question that has been asked, already answered uh, partially by uh, teaching assistants, but maybe your opinion would be nice. So how is RL different from a fundamental control problem? Is there a formal difference between those? Uh, I'm sorry, I just didn't hear part of the question. How is RL? Yeah, sorry. How is reinforcement learning different than the fundamental control problem? Is there a formal difference between those? Um, actually, there is none. Reinforcement learning is precisely the fundamental control problem. To be precise, it's the discrete time stochastic optimal control problem that the difference is not in the problem itself, it's in the way we solve it. In the classical control problem where you do, for example, linear quadratic, quadratic control, uh, you actually build the controller based on the model of the system. In reinforcement learning, we will build uh, controllers, but based on interaction samples and not a description of the, of the system. I think this will be clarified a little further in the class. So I suggest we move on and, um, and we'll get back to those questions if needed later on. Okay. So uh, I would like to start now the, to, to get a little deeper in this class by starting with a little paragraph, which I'm going to read aloud. It is a paragraph by Rich Sutton. It's present in the Sutton and Barto book, the Reinforcement Learning and Introduction book. Uh, and that paragraph says that the idea that we learn by interacting with our environment is probably the first to occur to us when we think about the nature of learning. When an infant plays, waves its arms or looks about, it has no explicit teacher, but it does have a direct sensory motor con connection to the environment. Exercises this connection produces a wealth of information about cause and effect, about the consequences of actions and about what to do in order to achieve goals. Throughout our lives, such interactions are undoubtedly a major source of knowledge about our environment and ourselves. Whether we're learning to drive a car or to hold a conversation, we're acutely aware of how our environment responds to what we do and we seek to influence what happens through our behavior. Learning from interaction is a foundational idea underlying nearly all theories of learning and intelligence. And I would just like to stress out that this is probably one of the best definitions we can give of learning in general, or at least artificial learning, machine learning. Uh, and I will also stress a small caveat here. This is a definition of learning. 
not specifically of reinforcement learning, although it does apply to reinforcement learning. So now it is worth giving some context around reinforcement learning. Why is it different than other types of learning? Which brings us to situating the question of reinforcement learning within machine learning. You probably have had classes on machine learning before, so you probably know that it is generally accepted that there are three strongly distinct categories of problems in machine learning, namely supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Let's try to distinguish them all uh, very clearly by answering the three following questions. What's the abstract problem each category is trying to solve? What is the data provided to the algorithm, which should be related to that abstract problem? And we'll try to give examples of algorithms in supervised and supervised and reinforcement learning just so that you have the keywords and something to, to ground your actions on, your, your ideas on. So let's start with supervised learning. Supervised learning is about learning a function. It's about predicting outputs given some inputs. This function is a function f of x equals y. And to learn this function, we are given data under the form of pairs x, y's, where x is an input and y is a label that has been put on x by a supervisor, which is why we call it supervised learning. If y is categorical, then we talk about a classification task. If y is continuous or belongs to a metric space, then we talk about regression tasks. And common algorithms for this, you probably know them already, uh, nowadays, we would talk about neural networks and deep learning. Uh, in the past, probably would be have been talking about support vector machines or random forests, for instance. So this is the realm of supervised learning, where we actually try to learn a function given representative examples x, y's of this function. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, defines itself by opposition to supervised learning. In unsupervised learning, we don't try to learn a function precisely because there is no supervisor that, um, that labels the x data with the label y. Instead, unsupervised learning is about discovering structure in the data, grouping um, items together by similarity, or finding embedding spaces, latent spaces, so that we can actually describe the data through a few variables, fewer at least than the number of variables used to, to describe it in general. So the input data of unsupervised learning is unlabeled data, a collection of examples x. And the key uh, problems of unsupervised learning are generally related to clustering, clustering data points or clustering dimensions, or dimensionality reduction. And key algorithms there are named k-means or principal component analysis, for example. Reinforcement learning, on the other hand, is a bit like supervised learning, is concerned with learning a function. It is concerned with learning a function that represents a behavior. This function maps states or observations to commands or actions. This function, which we will write pi, and in this present case, I write it pi of s equals a. This function, we wish to learn it so that it represents an optimal behavior. And the analogy with supervised learning stops there, because the data that reinforcement learning relies on is not examples of correct actions to perform in a given state, which would definitely be a case of supervised learning. These uh, examples are rather experience samples under the form of a state, an action that was performed in this state, and then a second state, which is the state that we have reached at the next time step, and a reward signal that tells us how happy we are about this transition, S A S prime. And those experience samples are actually samples that represent the dynamics of the environment we interact with over several time steps, which makes a very strong difference with supervised learning. The output of a reinforcement learning algorithm is generally a policy, and we'll introduce another notion, which is called a value function a bit later on. And key algorithms uh, that you will discover, at least throughout our LVS, but I hope we'll discover more than them, than, than those are, for example, Q-learning or policy gradients. So this table helps really distinguish the different natures of the problems tackled, which are very different in nature. The reinforcement learning problem itself is about finding the optimal policy for a given environment. 
So in the end, we could ask the question, which I've already partially answered, how is this different from supervised learning? Well, this is different from supervised learning because we don't build our behavior, our policy upon examples of correct SA pairings. We rather have samples of the environment's dynamics, how the environment behaves if I actually do some action in some state. An important notion in reinforcement learning is that this reward signal, this R in the sample that we will base our, our um, policy on, this R is the valuation of the current transition. So it tells us whether we're happy or not about having applied action A in the last state S that we have visited. But somehow this reward that we obtained during this transition could not have been obtained if the full trajectory of the system to control did not go through a set of states. Um, and so maybe the credit for gaining the reward R in a single transition SAS prime should also be assigned to previous transition and previous actions that led us along this trajectory to reach the current state S. This problem is called credit assignment, and it is intrinsic to controlling dynamic systems. It is intrinsic to problems which have a temporal uh, dependency like reinforcement learning, and we'll get back to it because this is a really an important keyword. Reinforcement learning is the only, uh, among those three problems, the only problem that is concerned with credit assignment, assigning uh, the value of R to past actions and states. So um, let's jump on to a second poll because I don't want you to fall asleep and I want you to stay active. So please pick the true statements in the three statements below. If you click on the link, you will actually be offered the same three statements and we'll take a look in say, 30 seconds at the results. So I'll wait until we have 200 answers at least, and then I'll just take a look at the results. There we go. So uh, which uh, answer was true? So sorting new emails as spam or not, given a million label emails is a reinforcement learning task. So that is false. I do agree with the majority of you. Um, it is uh, not a reinforcement learning task because there is no dependency between uh, emails. When you actually label an email as spam or non-spam, it doesn't affect at all the next email you will receive. So it's not a dynamical system that you're trying to control. So this is really a supervised learning problem. Deciding what move to play at chess based on thousands of previous games is a reinforcement learning task. Okay, that is partially true. This is partially true because indeed you are right. It is a dynamic system. Uh, it evolves over time and the action that you perform um, actually has an influence on the next state, but it's not totally a reinforcement learning problem because it is a game. It's an adversarial game. Uh, it's a two players game. Uh, and we'll see a bit later in the class why uh, it's not directly a reinforcement learning problem. So, but th that was the only really correct answer. Incrementally improving the accuracy of a radar detection software from online collected data as a reinforcement learning task. So no, this is a, a this is kind of a false positive for everybody. Uh, generally, people are lured and say, yes, this is a reinforcement learning task because behind reinforcement learning, we generally hear reinforcement and we believe that adaptation is linked to reinforcement. No, this is actually just an online supervised learning task. It's learning a function based on uh, data that arrives uh, with online adaptation. 
but all online adaptation is not necessarily reinforcement. So since this problem of improving uh, radar accuracy is uh, not a sequential decision problem, since it's not the problem of controlling a dynamic system, it is not a reinforcement learning problem. So let's get back to the, the class. Um, so really, I, I wanted to, to, to take you all through those few notions about reinforcement learning um, so that we start debunking misconceptions and, and uh, acquiring common vocabulary for describing um, what we will be working with. And I will just conclude this uh, situation of reinforcement learning within machine learning uh, by making connections to the different inspirations for reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning draws in inspiration from control theory and stochastic processes for the modeling part. So the hypothesis we will make on the um, system to control, so the environment we will interact with. And it also draws inspiration and algorithms and notations from statistics, optimization, and cognitive psychology for the learning part. So for designing the algorithms that actually build up the policies that we will, um, that we will try to find. So now we are ready to dive a little more into uh, our reinforcement learning per se. And so we'll uh, dive into section four from plain words to first variable. And for this, we will take an example, which is a medical prescription example. Suppose a patient, so this person here, walks into a clinic with her medical files, those data there. Uh, in this medical file, you have medical history, x-rays, blood work. So you have lots of variables and information under the shape of images, text, uh, binary values, common um, uh, continuous values, sorry. And you, as her doctor, need to write a prescription to get her better. So let us use this example to formalize the process of deciding what to write on the prescription and see how this is a reinforcement learning problem and how we will cast our reinforcement learning problems in general. So we will start by describing our patient. For this, we will introduce patient variables. The patient state now, so the variables that describe the patient now is gonna be uh, called S0 and future states will be called ST. The medical file of the patient allows us to define a certain number of variables that characterize the patient now. Um, and future measurements will be noted ST. Please note that ST is a random vector. I will indifferently use random vector or random variable in, in this class. Uh, and so ST is a random vector taking different values in a certain description space for the patient. And that description space, we will call it state space and write it S. <coughs> and so <coughs> ST is a random vector that takes different values at different time steps, describing how the patient, uh, well, describing the health of the patient. Now let's focus on the prescription. We want to write a prescription and a prescription is a series of recommendations that we will give to the patient over the course of treatment saying, okay, on uh, odd days, you take drug A and on even days, you take drug B. And if you're feeling better, then please don't take this drug. So it's really a series of recommendations over several time steps that we will give to the patient over the course of treatment. It is thus a sequence AT um, of variables AT, which we will call actions. These treatments AT are random variables too. They take their value in some space, which we will call action space A. And the patient will evolve over time steps. Her evolution follows a certain probability distribution over states, P of ST, um, across time. So eventually we realize that ST defines a random process, that is the evolution of a random variable across time steps that describes the patient's evolution under the influence of past states and actions. And overall, the physician's goal is to bring the patient from an unhealthy state as zero to a healthy, smiley situation. The, this goal is not only defined by the final state of the patient, but by the full trajectory followed by the variables ST and AT. For example, prescribing a drug that damages the patient's liver or letting the patient exercise too much pain over the course of treatment is strongly discouraged in general by academies of medicine. So we will define a criterion. 
uh, over that sequence of states and actions that allows us to quantify how good a trajectory is in the joint S times A uh, state and action space. And what we want to obtain is we want to obtain a way to choose actions A so that trajectories have the highest possible value for the criterion. So if we wrap it up, we uh, consider a patient that is in a state S, which is a random variable. Um, the instruction at time T is a random variable too. The prescription is thus a collection of random variables, an infinite collection of those. The patient's evolution is also an infinite collection of random variables uh, that is a random process the, that, that represents the patient's trajectory in the state space. And the value of the trajectory is some criterion J over the realizations of these random variables. It also seems reasonable to assume that the physician's recommendations, so the probability distribution of AT at step T, be dependent on previously observed states from S0 to ST and recommended treatment from A0 to AT minus one. So we're almost at the first step of strongly modeling uh, and introducing hypotheses on reinforcement learning. I will just debunk one common mis misconception now. You will often see the following type of drawing. Uh, you can probably find that in your web browser by typing reinforcement learning in your favorite search engine. You will often see the following type of drawing along with a sentence like, Reinforcement learning is concerned with the problem of an agent performing actions to control an environment. Although this sentence is not false per se, it conveys an important misconception that may be grounded in a too simplistic anthropomorphic analogy. Generally, next to this drawing, you have the drawing of a maze where a robot tries to navigate in a maze and exit the maze. And generally people write that the agent state is the position of the agent. Uh, and at some other places, uh, people write that the environment state is characterized by some variables. This distinction here between agent and environment is confusing at best because there is no separation between agent and environment. A better vocabulary is probably to talk about a system to control that is described through its observed state. This system in turn is controlled by the application of action issued from a policy or control law. So the process of learning this policy is really what reinforcement learning is concerned with. And this is why this drawing, which is, I admit, less shiny than the one above, it might actually be also less misleading. There is no distinction between the state of the agent and the state of the environment. We rather have a system to control and we will control it through the observation of on this state. So really, now that we have um, stripped reinforcement learning examples from misconceptions and, and we've started introducing variables and we, we actually have started modeling things. And understanding real uh, reinforcement learning is a three-stage rocket. And we're, we're going to build this rocket in the rest of this class. So we will try to answer the three questions. What is the system to control? What are its properties? What are the hypotheses I will make on the system to control? What is an optimal strategy? How can I characterize it? And once I know how to characterize that optimal strategy based on the properties of the system to control, how do I actually learn such a, such, a, uh, such a strategy? So we will actually only talk about learning in the last part of the notebook. So that will be uh, section seven. So let's uh, just write this short exercise. I will leave you one minute to, to go through that exercise. I'll set up a timer here. Um, and so suppose that instead of treating a patient, we want to learn to swing the pole up in the cart pole example. And the question, I would like you to take a piece of paper and just write it down for yourself. What are the state description variables? There might be several good answers there. What are the action variables? And I will, I will suggest a, an answer after a short minute.
Okay, so um, my proposed answer to that, which is definitely not the only possible answer, is pretty simple, is I will model the system that we have to control through the position and velocity of the cart and the position and the angular position and angular velocity of the pole uh, with respect to the vertical axis. This uh, system of equations, actually, if I write the mechanical forces that apply on that mechanical system, um, can be written as a first order differential equation, uh, which in, turns, uh, in turn allows me to, to move from one state, one realization of those four variables, uh, to another one uh, over a certain time interval. So that defines a discrete time control problem. And the command or the action could be, for example, the force F applied on the cart. So my real goal there was to, to actually have you write on a piece of paper uh, your own ideas. So now let's, we have introduced almost everything we need and we just need to take a, a higher point of view and formalize this a little more. So we will dive into section five um, and we'll introduce the framework of Markov decision processes that is the framework uh, within which we will model our sequential decision problems. We uh, thus need to take a higher view than the examples we've seen so far and develop a general theory for describing problems such as writing a prescription for our patients. Let us assume that we have a set of states, S, describing the system that we want to control, and a set of actions, A, we can apply on this system. Uh, curing patients is actually a conceptually difficult task. So to keep things grounded and simple, we're going to use a small toy example called Frozen Lake and work our way to more general concepts. It's also the occasion to familiarize a little bit with the programming interface of OpenAI Gym, which is a collection of reinforcement learning environment. It's not the only one available. It's one that is rather well known and, and used throughout the community, uh, although it's not the only one. So I will import Jim, that collection of environments, uh, and I will, among the environments of Jim, I will take the toy text family and, and recover the frozen lake environment as FL. I will just write of my environment is Jim.make of frozen lake V0, and I will call the render method. Um, and here is what the render method tells me. Basically, the game's goal is to navigate across this four by four grid, which represents a lake, from position S, like start, up to position G, like goal, in order to retrieve a frisbee that has been thrown across the lake. Um, and the goal is to retrieve the frisbee while avoiding falling into the holes H. Frozen positions are slippery, so you don't always move in the intended direction. Reaching the goal provides a reward of one, and otherwise you get a reward of zero. Falling into a hole or reaching the goal ends an episode. It's interesting at this point to actually notice that falling into the hole doesn't incur a penalty. Falling into a hole uh, just gets a reward of zero. It just finishes the episode. If you're curious, you can take a look at the funny description uh, by calling help of FL Frozen Lake on. Right now, we're not going to do it. Um, we are going to move forward. But in case you start this notebook again later, I encourage you to read this. Um, and so here is a poll for you. Two questions. How many states are there in this game and how many actions? So here are the proposed answers. Two states, x, y, one action, move, or 16 states and four actions, 17 states and four actions, 70 states and one action. And Okay, there is a demand from the participants to ap apparently reduce the menu on the left. I can probably do that when I get back to... So I'll let you answer the, the question and um, how do I hide this again? There we go, and I will hide it somewhere very far. <laughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> okay, I thought the menu on the left would actually help you guys, but in case it's not useful, uh, fine with me. 
Um, okay, so let's take a look at the poll's results. Um, it's not such a difficult question, so that I, I don't expect much difficulty on this one. How many states and actions? Uh, so we have 165 answers. I'm just going to display the results. So most people actually agree that there are 16 states and four actions. Um, I do agree with this statement too. Um, here's my answer here. We have 16 positions on the map. So the state of the system to control, which could be confused with the state of the agent. Uh, the state of the system to control are it is one of those 16 discrete values and the number of actions is four because we have the four navigation actions. We can confirm that by printing the environments uh, observation space and action space, which are discrete sets of size 16 and four respectively. So at every time step, the system is in state ST and we decide to apply action AT. This results in observing a new state ST plus one and receiving a scalar reward signal RT for this transition. RT tells us how happy we are with the last transition. It is a value, a, a, a continuous value that tells us how, how good the last transition was. For example, in Frozen Lake, all transitions have reward zero, except for the one that reaches the goal, which yields reward one. Uh, we can verify this and introduce a few utility functions on the way. And I just want to remind you that all those notations here are random variables. This will come in handy a little later. So I will just define actions as a dictionary of indices uh, that are mapped to arrows, just for readability. I define a function that uh, converts the index of row and columns to the number of the state and the invert transformation that converts the number of the states into rows and columns. And I will just print the actions and take a look at the, um, the state, which is on the fourth row and the third column, because my numbering starts at zero and takes the second action. So that's actually the third, so that's moving right. So that's a state that's very close to the goal and moves right, so should reach the goal in a way. So if you apply moving right from state three, two, you actually reach the same state, you stay where you are with probability one third and get reward zero, you reach the goal and get reward one with probability one third, and you reach the state that's just above you um, with probability one, one third and reward zero. Let's now make our main assumption about the systems we want to control. They can be either the patient example or the frozen lake example or the cart pole one. We will assume um, that the probability of reaching state ST plus one and observing reward RT is a probability that is conditioned by the full history of states and actions. And this is actually only dependent on the last state and action. So this is the Markov property. We're supposing that our system behaves in a Markovian way. And such a system will then be called a Markov decision process. Generally, when we describe a Markov decision process, we separate the state's dynamics, so the probability of ST plus one, and the rewards dynamics, so the probability of RT in two, by saying it's P of ST plus one given STAT times the probability of RT given STAT and ST plus one. This leads in turn to the general definition of an MDP, which you will probably find in every reinforcement learning article um, in the world. A Markov decision process is given by a set of states, a set of actions, a Markovian transition model P of ST plus one given STAT, which describes the dynamics of my environment, uh, of my system to control. Generally, we write this transition model P of S prime given SA for brevity. A reward model, that is the probability of RT given STAT and ST plus one, that we generally write R of SA or of SA S prime. If we write just the two first uh, variables SA, it means we have taken the expectation uh, uh, across S primes. And uh, a set of discrete decision epochs, these are the decision epochs at which we will have to apply the actions AT. Most of the results I will present here in the context of, uh, of this notebook uh, can be found in, in Potterman's classic book, uh, Markov Decision Process, Dyna Discrete Dynamics Stochastic Programming, which I strongly recommend uh, as a textbook for uh, Markov Decision Processes in general. 
if the horizon, if H, the upper bound on the set of discrete decision epochs tends to infinity, then we are in presence of an infinite horizon control problem. And since in this class and in most of the RLVS classes, we will work with infinite horizon problems, we shall identify the MDP with only the four tuple S, A, P, R, and we'll forget about the set of discrete decision epochs. So in the end, in RL, we wish to control a trajectory, the trajectory of a system that we suppose behaves as a mark of decision process. So we still have that same drawing from the beginning, and we are making the assumption here that the system behaves as an MDP, a mark of decision process. Now suppose that an oracle decides on how to choose actions at each time step. So that oracle decides on a probability distribution for each of the variables AT. Uh, this probability distribution will write it in short pi of T. So it's a different distribution at every time step. The collection of all pi T's is the oracle's policy, the way it behaves. One policy, implies one specific distribution over trajectories over the frozen lake or over the course of treatment for the patient. More generally, um, if we have the policy and we have the knowledge or the, the distribution of the initial state as zero, those two fully condition the sequence S0, A0, R0, and so on. Uh, so the full trajectory of the system we want to control. In Frozen Lake, as in the patient's example, some trajectories are obviously better than others. We're happier with some, um, some trajectories than others. Uh, so we need a criterion to compare trajectories together. Intuitively, this criterion should reflect the idea that a good policy accumulates as much reward as possible along a trajectory. So let's compare the policy that always moves to the right and the policy that always moves to the left by summing the rewards obtained along trajectories and then averaging these rewards across trajectories. So for this, um, I will draw 50,000 episodes for each policy over a maximum 200 steps uh, horizon. I'll consider that after 200 steps, the episode ends. And I will just declare a vector V right where I will store all the values uh, for accumulated rewards over, all, uh, over um, episodes. And for I in range of number of episodes, I will reset my environment. And for T in range of horizon, I will call a function called step where I will apply action move right. Uh, and so the environment will transition to a next date. It will receive a certain reward and a flag that tells it whether it has fallen into a hole or not. So in V right of I, I will accumulate R. Uh, and if done is true, if we have fallen into a hole, then we will just stop this loop and reset the environment, move on to the next I and fill the next V right of I. I'll do the exact same thing with V left. Um, and I will print the estimated value, the empirical average of, the, of what I can expect to, to accumulate as rewards from the uh, original state under the, right, the policy that always moves right and the same thing for the policy that always moves left. So I'm just waiting for this to finish. Should take a few seconds. So apparently the policy that always moves right from the starting state uh, in, um, in Frozen Lake seems to have an expected gain overall trajectories of 0 0.03 with a pretty large variance. But apparently the policy that moves left has a zero expected gain um, with a zero variance. So if our criterion is actually to gain as much as possible on average, then the policy that always moves right is better than the policy that always moves left. Let's try to, to make this a little more abstract now. In the general case, this sum of rewards on an infinite horizon is a sum of scalar values, so it might be unbounded. So we will introduce what we will call the gamma discounted sum of rewards from a starting state S and under policy pi, and this is a random variable, g pi of S. That is the sum of rewards, but where each reward is discounted by a factor gamma to the power of t, and the conditioning on the right-hand side of this equation, I will leave it out in further references. So I'm just writing it now. 
It's basically the sum of rewards along a trajectory that starts in ACE, that behaves, that draws actions according to policy pi, for which the transition dynamics are governed by the MDP's transition model and the reward dynamics are governed by the reward model of the MDP. So G pi of S represents the random variable uh, describing what we can gain in the long term by applying the actions from pi. Then given the starting states, we can define what we will call the value of S under policy pi, which is the expected value of G pi of S. This defines the value function V pi of a policy pi, because this allows me to define this criterion in every single state and every single possible starting state of my system to control. And so V pi of S is a mapping from states to uh, real variables, uh, scalars, that maps states to the expected value of the accumulated reward over an infinite horizon. And given a distribution row zero on starting states, then we can actually map the policy not only to its value function, but we can map it to a single scalar value by taking the average over all possible starting states, so over all row zero of V pi of S. Note that this definition, the definition of this criterion, is quite arbitrary. Instead of the expected sum of reward, we could have taken the average reward of all time steps as a criterion. Um, it was kind of arbitrary of me to, to impose that. We could actually have taken any other criterion, more or less exotic, um, that could help us compare policies together. Indeed, most of the reinforcement learning literature uses this discounted criterion in some specific cases with gamma equals one. Some of the reinforcement learning literature uses the average reward criterion and few works actually venture into more exotic criteria. So today we will limit ourselves to the discounted criterion, but I wanted to mention to you that other criteria exist and other people have studied other criteria. Okay, so now the fog is clearing up a bit. We have defined that our environment should be a mark of decision process. We have introduced a criterion that allows us to, to rank policies um, uh, among each other. And now, so now that we can compare policies given an initial state or an initial state distribution, we can define what is the policy that has the highest value, the highest rank. So an optimal policy is one that is better than any other given our criterion. So an optimal policy, pi star, is said to be optimal if and only if pi star is a maximizer of the value function. In other terms, a policy is optimal if it dominates over any other policy in every state. So pi star is optimal is equivalent to saying that for all states in S, for all other policies pi, the value, uh, the expected long-term re return in any state of pi star um, is greater than the value uh, under policy pi. Uh, an important remark here, note that although there may be several optimal policies, they all share the same optimal value function, which we will write V star for the value function of any optimal policy pi star. And so we will get to our first fundamental result, our first fundamental theorem, Fortunately for us, um, this is what we will call the optimal policy theorem. For a gamma discounted criterion, for an infinite horizon, there always exists at least one optimal stationary deterministic Markovian policy. So th this sounds really weird. Um, let's break down um, all these notions together. Let's explain a little. What do we mean by Markovian? We mean that this policy which is a distribution over actions at time step t should be conditioned by the whole history of states and actions. Um, if you consider two different histories uh, of states and actions that only have the last state in common, actually the distribution over at is the same, whatever the history is. So it is Markovian in the sense that it only depends on the last state st. And so we will write pi of at given st. The, this policy should also be stationary, meaning that the distribution on actions doesn't really depend on the time. If the state is the same, then the distribution on action is the same, regardless of whether we're in T or in T prime. 
And finally, this policy should be deterministic, meaning that uh, we can pick deterministically one single action in a given state. So what this theorem tells us is that among all possible policies, so among all possible ways of picking a t at time step t, at least one of these ways is a deterministic function that is both deterministic, stationary, and only depends on the current state. So it's a function, it's a mapping from S to A. This actually helps a lot because this is what we're looking for when we want to control our, our problems. We're looking for policies. And so right now we know that we don't have to search for optimal policies in a complex family of history dependent, stochastic, non-stationary policies instead we can simply search for a function pi of s equals a that maps states to action. All right, let's wrap it all up. Um, our goal in this section was to formally define the search for the best strategy, strategy in our game of Frozen Lake and in the game, in the, the, sorry, in the medical prescription problem. This has led us to formalizing the discrete time stochastic optimal control problem. This problem is formalized through the definition of a Markov decision process. So an environment or a system to control that is discrete time, non-deterministic, non-linear, but has the Markov property. This is gonna be, we're going to assume that the environments we will interact with are MDPs. In this framework, given that we will only use gamma discounted criteria over infinite horizon, we can take control policies to be simply mappings from states to action. We will use the policy evaluation criterion, which is the gamma discounted criterion. And our goal is to maximize the value function. So our goal is to find the policy that maximizes V pi of S. So we have actually built the first stage of our three stage rocket. Remember the first question is what it was the system to control. And so the answer to that question is the system to control is a Markov decision process uh, given by its states, its action, its transition model and, and its reward model. And we will control it with a policy pi, which is a mapping from states to action in order to optimize a criterion, which is the expected sum of discounted rewards on an infinite horizon. Okay, um, we're almost done with section five and it's gonna be time to take a little break. Uh, before that, I would like you to take this poll that we can discuss before the break. So this poll is about the limits of MDP modeling, about determining what is not an MDP and, and where the MDP model stops. So the question is, can these systems be modeled as MDPs? For example, uh, playing a tennis video game based on the single video frame. So the observation is a single video frame. Uh, then playing a tennis video game based on the full physical description of the ball and the players. So either variables or, well, you, you name it. Um, is the game of poker, uh, can, can it be modeled as an MDP? And is the collaborative game of Hanabi, um, if you don't know Hanabi, don't worry, don't answer that part of the question, uh, is the collaborative game of Hanabi, um, can we model it as an MDP? So I'll take a look at the dashboard and I'll wait until we have, say, at least 150 answers there. Uh, Maybe there are a couple of questions that uh, maybe uh, you can uh, address uh, after one also. Yes, we will take a break just after that. So I will take questions ju just once we're finished with this poll. Okay. So 127 answer, 146 should be okay now. Okay, so... Um, 19% of people think playing a tennis video game based on a single video frame uh, can actually be modeled as an MDP. I beg to defer. <laughs> this uh, might be, uh, we might be able to model it as an MDP, but the, um, one of the intuitive parts of, of defining a state that can be represented as having the Markov property is that the state and the current action should be enough 
should be enough to describe the transition to the next stage. The problem of having only a single video frame in a game of tennis is that on the single video frame, you don't see the velocity of the ball. So there is some possible confusion there. And although it might be possible to model such a game as an MDP, this is not really what we intend as an MDP, uh, say in plain words, uh, because the, the transition to the next state is not fully determined by the current state and might be determined by, by a sequence of past states. On the other hand, playing a tennis video game based on a full physical description of the ball and players here might be a lot easier to model as an MDP precisely because the probability to transition to a new state is then um, really only conditioned by the current state and the current action being applied. Is the game of poker an MDP? And the answer there is no. Well, actually, let me get back to the, the answers because this is actually what is written here. Uh, the answer is no, because poker is a two-player adversarial stochastic game. So the key point here is it's a stochastic game, just like MDPs, but MDPs are one-player games. There is no adversarial presence in MDPs. We're just trying to optimize a behavior in a given environment, but the environment is not against us. Poker is a two-player adversarial stochastic game, so it is not an MDP. It is a broader class of problems called multiplayer stochastic games. And MDPs are a special class of that uh, where there's only a single player. And the collaborative game of Hanabi, if you're curious to know what it is, it is a game where you actually try to guess what other people uh, have in their hand. Um, and this game is mainly based on epistemic reasoning, that is reasoning on beliefs about the state of the world, uh, on beliefs about what I think that you think, or what I think that you think that I think, and so on. And so this type of state description is often, often difficult to encode within a Markovian dynamics model. So this is not a strong no answer. This is saying probably an MDP is not the right way to model the game of Hanabi. Okay, so it's 10.38. I'm pretty much running on time. Um, I'll be happy to take questions, Sebastian, if you have some that you might have selected, or I can look at the Q&A, tell me. And otherwise, while I'm taking questions, I would suggest that we take a break and that we start over again at 10.50. Okay, so there, are, so there have been uh, actually more than 40 questions in total, some of them just about the Google Collab, some uh, more about RL. Most of them have been uh, answered by the TAs, so thanks for that. Uh, I noted a couple of questions that, that you could address, uh, Emmanuel. So, uh, but uh, TAs are being answering that. Still, maybe the question might be interesting. So about the optimal policy theorem, uh, is the fact stated about optimal policy in an infinite MDP also true in non-stationary environments? So about the existence of such a policy, I guess it would not be stationary. Exactly, exactly. You need, you need to have an MDP whose properties do not change over time. So um, the system remains a dynamic system, but the transition model is always the same. It's just the state changes. Uh, and the reward model remains the same. So you need to have this stationarity of the model. Uh, properties of the world do not change uh, across time. Um, uh, and you also need to have the infinite horizon. As soon as you don't have the infinite horizon, then it's, it, it, it kind of falls under sense that um, the optimal policy will not be stationary anymore because when you have two, uh, two um, two steps to play in a given game, um, you don't necessarily have the same strategy as if you only have one single step to play. Okay. Um, so, small question, but uh, why is it not desirable to have a stochastic policy? Oh, very good question. Um, so, actually, it, it might be desirable to have a stochastic policy. The, what, the, what the optimal policy theorem tells us is that among all, all optimal policies, one of them at least is deterministic, stationary, and Markovian. But uh, let me answer that in two points. First thing is for MDPs, uh, it might be worth still looking into 
say, stationary Markovian but stochastic policies. And this is actually something that happens really often, um, especially when you're looking at, at continuous actions for robotics problem. I think Olivier Sigo will most likely talk about it a lot on his talk uh, uh, when he will talk about policy gradients. So first thing, it's, it's not undesirable. It's just that we know there is a policy that is deterministic. And a, a second part of the answer is that this is only true actually for MDPs. For example, there is no deterministic optimal policy for poker. Um, in two player games, which are not MDPs, um, then actually having stochastic policies is, is, an, is a necessity. So excellent question. Great. Uh, okay, so I'll mark it as sold. Thank you. Uh, how is tennis not adversarial and not stochastic? Oh, tennis is adver adversarial and stochastic too. But uh, yeah. so being stochastic uh, is not a problem for, for being an MDP, but you're right. Uh, being adversarial is a problem too. Um, I should have written in my, in my example, playing tennis against a bot. That always does the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and so there are questions about uh, handling problems that can't be models at NDPs, but I can see that the answers from uh, Erwin uh, Le Carpentier are very complete about that. So I would just skip this question. Uh, and I think, I think that's all for the moment. Uh, okay, there are some, I know, there are actually some other questions. Could you explain again why the rate of detection problem isn't a reinforcement learning task. Okay, um, maybe this problem was not fully specified, was not clear enough. Um, if I get back, okay, now I can't see my contents anymore. <laughs> um, if I get back to uh, the examples um, that we had before, uh, where was this one? Anyway, it's no big deal. I can do it without the example. Um, it was not a, a reinforcement learning problem because what we were trying to learn, uh, oops, sorry. Um, what we were trying to learn is a specific function that was just a, the detection of something, um, like mapping a, a state x to a certain value y. Uh, but when you actually make a decision, when you decide that some object is at a certain distance, from your, uh, given your current input, this does not affect at all the next input that you will witness. So there is no connection uh, between the measurement you have now and the measurement you will have in the future. So this is an adaptation problem, which can probably be solved via stochastic gradient descent and so via classical methods for adaptation, but this is not a sequential decision-making problem. All, or it's a, it's a collection of decision problems that are all independent of each other. I'm not sure I'm actually very clear for that. So in case I'm not, I'll leave the question open. I'll try to answer it uh, by, by writing uh, later on. Yeah, so for example, you can uh, mark, because you asked the question, you can forward it to the metrics uh, corresponding chat room. And then uh, I guess Emmanuel would be happy to, to elaborate on that. Sure. Great. Uh, okay, maybe one last. Okay, I see actually other questions that are popping up. Uh, <laughs> it would be great if you can explain the different sources, the different sources of stochastic. Maybe, maybe equilibrium. Sorry for the pronunciation means uh, in several practical applications. Okay, oh, well, Erwan just answered that, but ah, um, great. okay, I will, I will provide a slightly different answer. Um, you can see that Erwan is a mathematician. He answers with uh, formal and abstract concepts. Uh, sources of stochasticity is really problem dependent. For example, when you're trying to drive a robot, uh, the stochasticity in the, in the evolution of the state of the robot, suppose that this robot has wheels, and um, it's rolling on the ground. Well, the stochasticity comes from the noise in the electrical en uh, engines. It might come from friction on the ground. It might come from just parts getting loose. And this induces the fact that applying twice the same command on the same measured state of the robot 
results in a variety, a, a distribution over next possible states. So that is the, the example that we could take from robotics. But if you take another example, like for example, um, having an investment portfolio on a financial market and wishing to, to optimize an investment strategy, then the stochasticity really comes from the behavior of non-rational humans uh, or the evolution of other things. Um, you might also have, in some specific cases, phenomena that are chaotic that come into play, like, for example, when you try to control the fluid flow around uh, the wing of an airplane, um, while well, part of the flow might actually be chaotic, which induces a distribution over next possible states, uh, given variations on the measurements that are just so small that they cannot be detected uh, by, by the measurements. So all, all those are examples of where the stochasticity comes from in various different examples. Um, and just one last example, if you take the patient prescription example, um, there, you have a whole lot of different sources of, of uncertainty and stochasticity there. Uh, you might have uncertainty on the model of, of the patient. So how does really the patient behave? I mean, his immune system or, and, and inside the patient itself, um, the fact that some concentration of antibodies actually have some effect might actually be a stochastic effect in itself. So I hope all those examples actually clarify where the stochasticity comes from and why our systems are not necessarily fully deterministic. Uh, thank you. So there are actually many questions. So maybe we can make a five minute break and uh, address questions later on, or we address them now. You, you, we can do as you want. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. Keeping on answering questions as long as I can drink a little. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. I don't want to keep everybody so I around, but uh, anybody can take a break while I'm. I see. Okay, so I see, okay, I see, uh, uh, okay, let me see. At least two questions that we can address uh, right away. So is there an assumption about the set of actions in MDPs? Can we model a set of actions that are changing over time? Okay, so first, uh, the assumption is that the set of action is fixed and, um, and generally you make the assumption that um, you, you generally suppose that it is a compact in the sense that it is a set that is both, both um, closed and bounded. Um, the most general definition, mathematically speaking, of the action set is the, the family of borrow sets uh, across a measurable set. Uh, but in general, we just suppose that it is an ensemble that is either finite or countable or bounded in general. So. This is a very general definition. And, and the second part of the question, uh, can the action set change over the course of time? Well, um, in the strict definition of an MDP, no. But in practice, you could define a super action set, which contains all possible actions, even if some of them are not available at certain times. And the actions that are not available at certain times just have no effect. This is a, a trick, let's say, to, to take into account varying action sets because it's not taken into account by the general theory. And you have researchers that are actually working on the question of adapting to varying input signatures or uh, output signatures for policies. Uh, and it's a very uh, recent and active field of research. So there is no general theory on, around that. Uh, the key theory of MDP supposes a fixed action set. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, why do we say a policy is optimal? Quote, if and only for every state, the evaluation is higher than using over policies. Quote, instead of saying that, quote again, J of pi is the maximum all possible pi's. Okay. Um, because J of pi is actually, uh, okay, let's put it the other way. Um, my policy will be optimal if it is actually better than any other policy from any starting state. So this is basically saying that the value function of that policy is larger than the value function of any other policy, but this should be true in all states. What J of pi says is that the average of the values across a certain distribution 
which might actually span the full state space, should be larger than the, um, the, the average of values across uh, for, for the other policy. So that J of pi criterion, although it will be used throughout the class, like this class N and future classes, uh, this uh, J of pi criterion is actually weaker than the notion of a policy dominating another one in every single state. Great, and I, I, I see actually that some other related question was asked and answered uh, similarly, so that's really great. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, in a two-player game, can we model each player as an MVP, each player we learn to compete against each other? No, because, um, well, we could do that, but then that would not be an MDP anymore. That's like a fairer answer. And why would we not be able to do that? Because in, if we model each player as an MDP, as soon as the other player takes an action, this changes the, the transition model of the first player. So the transition model is not stationary anymore. And so this is not an MDP anymore. This is basically the problem of joint actions in two player games. Right. Uh, okay. And I have a uh, question. I can see one by Benno uh, Crutcher. Uh, can you explain again uh, um, over what we're summing when we take the expected value of G of S? Okay. We're summing over possible trajectories. G of S is a random variable. So it's a scalar random variable. It's the accumulated reward along a trajectory. And when we take the expected value of that random variable, we are actually um, averaging across all possible realizations of that random variables. And all those realizations correspond to various trajectories under the current policy. So. Okay. I think it's probably a good thing if we start over because otherwise I, I yeah I agree it. and I agree uh, any questions that are left unanswered I'll try to answer them in matrix later on okay okay so now up to the next question in our uh, three state rocket <laughs> characterizing uh, optimal policies and characterizing value functions so um, Let's recall just what we've said so far. We've introduced one main modeling framework assumption. We're supposing that the systems we're interacting, sorry, that the systems we're interacting with are Markov decision processes. And we said, okay, now, from now on, we will take our policies to be mappings from states to actions and our criteria to be always the uh, gamma discounted criterion. So, now we would like to formally characterize what is an optimal policy and how we can actually find it. So we will work our way up from uh, ground intuitions. Let's consider the maze below, which is very simple, um, three by three, and where an agent can move north, south, see east and west. The resulting transition is always deterministic. So this is kind of a degenerated MDP. And a reward of plus one is gained when exiting the maze from the top right corner, which terminates the game. Otherwise, all rewards are zero, and bumping into a wall also terminates the game with a reward of zero. Let's consider the policy that always moves east. So I've drawn it here. And here is the first poll. Um, without writing any equation, just given this plain words definition of the problem, what is the value of the top right cell under this policy? And here are the um, answers I'm proposing, zero, one, or gamma. Well, people that have actually moved forward and started answering uh, later questions. <laughs> So what's the value of the top right cell? I'll wait a little to have a little more answers. It's 
say I'll wait until 150. So yes, you are right. I do agree. The value of the top right cell is one. Why? Because, well, if we move right from the top right cell, we immediately get that reward of, of one. And so there is no discount being applied to that reward. So now let's suppose that gamma is equal to 0.9. Second poll, without writing any equation, what is the value of the top middle cell under this policy? So again, I'm going back to my results. These questions are very simple, uh, I, I admit, but it's, um, oh wait, sorry, my question was not complete actually, of the top middle cell and the value of the bottom right cell. Oops. Okay, I'll just move on to the answers. Um, so I do agree with you again, and we're just gonna take a look at the answer here. So the value of the two, three cell is the expected discounted sum of, of what one gets from applying pi from two, three. Since pi is deterministic and all the transitions are deterministic too, pi of two, three always takes us to the state three, three. So the value of the two, three state is zero, the immediate reward, plus gamma, what I will get from applying pi in 3, 3, which is 1. And so the overall value is gamma times 1, so it's 0.9. And the value of 3, 1 is the expected. OK, this is actually a mistake. The, the value of 3, 1 is I'll just run into a wall, so I'll get 0, and the episode will end. So, um, the, so the value is 0. Let's actually draw that value function. So in this cell, the value is one, this one it's gamma, and this one it's gamma squared. And since we're always moving right and everything is deterministic, the value in all the other cells are zero. Suppose now that you are currently in cell one, two, so this cell here, and you would like to choose what action to take. You are free to decide the action that you should take in cell one, two. Suppose also that you know the value function uh, that we have drawn above here. And you need to put a scalar value to compare actions together. So you have those four actions, north, south, east, and west, and you want to evaluate each action. And to do that, let's estimate what we can get by applying the action and then using gamma times v pi of s in the, in the resulting state to estimate what we can obtain in the long run after this first action. We will call this Q pi of the original starting state um, and the action as the utility we estimate for each action A in the starting state X, Y. And so the poll now says, what is the value of Q pi of one, two for all actions A in north, south, east, and west? What seems to be the most interesting first action to take if we follow pi after this first action? And so the, the, um, the question is only, on the poll, is only the second one. So what is the most interesting first action? I'll let you answer. Okay, we're almost at 100. So everybody agrees that the best first action is north. And now the question is, okay, we all agree that intuitively this is true, why? Well, precisely because we can compute what we can expect to gain uh, according to what we just said before. What we define as Q pi of going north is the reward we obtain by going north, so that's zero plus gamma times what we will get on the long run from applying policy pi in the state we reach. So that's gamma squared, which is equal to 0 0.279, uh, 729. On the other hand, going south uh, is zero plus gamma times zero, going east is zero plus gamma times zero, and going west just ends the episode. So it's zero and no gamma at all. 
So uh, you're right, the best action seems to be north. So let's keep on playing with this little game. An optimal policy is actually quite easy to guess. Uh, so let's draw the optimal value function, which is the value function of any optimal policy. So we basically uh, can guess that that optimal value function is actually uh, related to the shortest path from a cell to the exit. So one gamma, gamma squared, gamma to the power three, and so on and so forth. And so the furthest uh, cell to from the exit will have value gamma to the power six. Let's define Q star of x, y, a as the utility we estimate for each action a in x, y, if it is followed by an optimal policy. So now the question we will ask is, what is Q star of one, two, that's still, still at same cell, one, two, a, for action A in north, south, east, and west. And what seems to be the most interesting first action to take if we act optimally after. Uh, so I'm asking you to actually rank the actions by utility. Uh, to gain a little time, I will not give you so much time to answer that question. I will just jump onto the answer right now. So Q star is actually what we gain immediately plus gamma times what we expect to receive from applying an optimal policy in the state that we will reach. Uh, so contrarily to the Q pi uh, function that we defined just before, Q star applies an optimal policy from the state we reach. So Q star of one to north is zero because immediate reward is zero plus gamma times gamma squared. So that's gamma to the power of three. Q star of one to south is going to be gamma to the power of five. East is gamma to the power of five. And interestingly, west is gamma to the power of four. So the best action seems to be north followed by west. And after that, south and east are tied. Let's move on with those questions. What property has the policy that always picks greedily the Q star maximizing action in each state? Well, the answer is pretty simple. It's quite kind of intuitive. That policy is optimal. Why? Because it actually maximizes the choice of the first action, given that it will act optimally afterwards. So that action that is picked greedily with respect to Q star is actually the optimal or is actually an optimal action in the starting state. And now for uh, the few final questions, suppose that the cell one, two, that cell that we've, we've been looking at all across this exercise is a special slippery cell. Going north, all the rest is still deterministic, but in this cell going north has a 0.7 probability of actually reaching the, um, the state that is north, but also a 0.2 probability of staying in the same place and a 0.1 probability of slipping aside to the two, two cell. Note that this uh, change in the probabilities actually changes the problem in the optimal expected uh, return function, uh, the, opt the optimal one, V star. So V star is not valid anymore. But the question I'm asking here is, given this new problem, can you write Q star of one, two, so that cell we've been looking at north, as a function of v star of one, three, v star of one, two, and v star of two, two. We can't use the values for v star that we had before, but I would just like us to link q star to the value of v star. And so the answer is pretty straightforward. If, when we take action n in state one, two, there are three possible outcomes. With probability 0.7, we reach the state that is at the north and get reward zero. 0.2, which we stay in place and get reward zero. And with probability 0.1, we slip to the right and get reward zero. So what we can expect to get from applying N in one, two is 0.7 times zero plus gamma times the value V star in one, three plus 0.2 times zero plus gamma V star in one, two plus 0.1 times zero gamma V star in two, two. If I, um, remove all useless terms and factor this out by gamma, this is gamma times the sum of the probabilities to reach the states times the value of the state we will reach. And for the final question, now you can remark that if we knew the action pi star of one, two, that, would, that should be taken by an optimal policy in one, two, then 
Q star of 1, 2 for this specific pi star of 1, 2 action would actually be precisely the optimal long-term return V star from 1, 2, since it would be the expected return of a policy that acts optimally at every time step, including the first one. So using that remark, suppose that an oracle tells us what the optimal action is in 1, 2. Using the previous ex exercise, so what we've written here, let's write v star of 1, 2 as a function of v star of 1, 3, v star 1, 2, and v star of 2, 2. And this is almost immediate. We have v star of 1, 2, which is actually q star of 1, 2 north, because the oracle told us that the optimal action was moving north. So actually, v star of 1, 2 is equal to what we have written here. And so we have linked v star of 1, 2 to v star of 1, 3, v star of 1, 2, and v star of 2, 2. So we have a linear system of equations. And this system of equations could be written in every single state of the problem. And so we will end up having a linear system of as many equations as states and with uh, as, many and as many unknowns as states as well. So we have actually introduced the key concepts upon which this whole section is built, v and q functions, and the relation between v of s and v of s prime when s prime can be reached from s in one action. The next steps now will actually consist in doing the exact same thing we've done in this ex exercise, but in a formal way. We'll write this all formally. We'll prove strong properties. We'll actually enunciate strong properties. We'll cast them and derive algorithms for computing value functions and policies. So drawing inspiration from the exercises above, we can define the very important for us state action value function, which we call q pi. So q pi formally is the expected sum of discounted returns over an infinite horizon, given that the original, the initial state is as zero, but now the initial action is uh, a zero is a, and after time step zero, I start acting according to policy pi. So if I wanna be precise and reuse the full notations from the MDP definition uh, earlier, Q pi of SA, is the expected value of a random variable that is the sum of rewards. But now the conditioning says that S0 equals S, A0 equals A, that is the big difference, and then AT equals pi of ST for all subsequent uh, time steps. And the rest doesn't change. So Q pi of SA can actually be uh, broken down in by separating the very first step and the other ones. It tells us that it's the expectation over S prime, the state that we will reach after applying A of R of S A S prime plus gamma V pi of S prime. And if we wanna use the other notation that says R of S A, well, that's exactly the definition of SA, so Q pi of SA equals R of SA plus gamma, the expectation uh, over S prime of V pi of S prime. So in a drawing, this is basically what it looks like. You're in a state S, you're going to perform action A, you're going to reach state S prime, which is drawn according to the distribution P of S prime given SA. And in this state S prime, you know that applying policy pi on the long run will actually provide you with return V pi of S prime. And so Q S A is actually the sum of R of S A plus the average overall S primes of V pi of S prime. We can remark that V pi of S in the original S is actually Q pi of S pi of S by definition. So let's replace A by pi of S in the definition above and we obtain the important equation to characterize V pi. This equation says that V pi of S is equal to the immediate reward we get plus what we can expect to get from the next state we will reach. This equation uses V pi of S prime in all S primes that are reachable from S in order to define V pi of S. Since this equation is true in all S, this provides as many equations as we have states. And this brings us to um, the first notion about evaluating value functions. Uh, we have an evaluation equation that says V pi obeys the linear system of equations that for all S, V pi of S is equal to the immediate reward plus what I get on the long run. 
Similarly, Q pi of S A is equal to the immediate reward R of S A plus gamma, the expectation over S prime drawn according to P of S prime given S A of Q pi S prime pi of S prime. This leads us to the introduction of what we call the Bellman evaluation operator. That operator, in simple words, is just the operator that transforms function q pi into the function that is in the right-hand side of those equations. That works also for v pi. So t pi is an operator on value functions that transforms a function v of s uh, in r into another function v defined over s and taking values in r. That new function is t pi of v of s. And this is precisely the immediate reward I get plus the expectation over next state of the value defined over next states. If I want to write this expectation explicitly, I can write that it says the sum over next states of the probability to reach the state times v of s prime. Similarly, we can actually uh, have a slight notation abuse and introduce an evaluation operator with the same name over um, not state value functions, but state action value functions, so those Q value functions. So T pi is an operator on the state action value function that transforms the function Q defined over the S times A space into R into T pi of Q, which is the immediate reward plus the expected value over next state of what we get from the next state. So you can actually know that fundamentally, I have repeated four times the same thing in the last four sentences. But it's, it was, I believe, useful for all of us to play with those notions to actually make them concrete. So finding v pi, if I give you a policy pi, finding its value v pi or its value q pi boils down to solving the evaluation equation v equals t pi of v, respectively q equals t pi of q. We've actually gone a little far from our original frozen lake, frozen lake problem. So let's make this all very concrete. Remember, a policy is an agent's behavior. It is what conditions the sequence of actions will actually input to the system to control. In every state S, one can expect to gain V pi of S in the long run by applying pi. That's the definition of V pi. V pi of S is the sum of the reward in the first step and the expected long-term return from the next state, so gamma, the expectation of S prime of V pi of S prime. The function V pi actually obeys the linear system of equations above that simply link the value of a state with the values of its successors in an episode, in a trajectory. Let's stop for a minute on the T pi evaluation operator, uh, because this operator actually has two very nice properties. The first one is it's an affine operator. It, transforms a function in a linear way uh, into another function. So it defines a linear system of equations. Um, one can actually prove that this system of equations is full rank, but I will not go into details right now. And it's, it's almost straightforward to prove. The second really interesting pro property of T pi is that T pi is a contraction mapping. So basically what that means, and very specifically, T pi so is an operator that transforms functions into other functions. And it is a supremum norm contraction mapping over the set of functions, which is a proper set for defining contraction mappings. So uh, what that means is that the equation V equals T pi of V actually has a single unique solution. This is very intuitive for us because we have defined it um, that way. We have um, adopted a constructive uh, approach to, to T pi. But uh, actually proving that T pi is a contraction mapping is a bit tricky. And overall, this means that this equation has a single, optim a single solution. And that solution is precisely V pi, the value of policy pi. So let's use the second property to compute Q pi for the policy that always moves right on Frozen Lake. And I'm going to just give you a short reminder of what a contraction mapping is. Basically, if you take two functions uh, and pass them through a contraction mapping, the images of the two functions are closer to each other than the two original functions. So what I will do to compute Q pi is I will start with a function Q of SA. For example, I will take it equal to 0 for all SAs. And um, I will recall that in Frozen Lake, rewards are provided under the R of S A S prime form. 
So I will use this notation in, in what follows. And I will apply t pi to q0. Applying t pi to q0 gives me q1. So q1 is the sum over next state s prime of p of s prime given s a of r of s a s prime plus gamma q0 s prime of uh, and s prime, uh, pi of s prime, sorry. So this is q1, which is just equal to t pi of q0. In plain words, if I look at physically what this corresponds to, q pi is the one step expected return under policy pi. If I apply t pi twice, then I get q2, and q2 is defined as function of q1. And this is the two step expected return for a, a trajectory that lasts for two steps. And I can go on and so on and, and, and on. And eventually, I know that q pi is the infinite step return. So if we apply t pi enough times, qn should actually become closer to q pi, whatever the initial chosen value for q0, because that chosen value for q0 will actually be multiplied multiple times by gamma. And so that value will just vanish. In more formal words, because t pi is a contraction mapping, and what we've done intuitively here is actually proving uh, that it is a contraction mapping, because t pi is a contraction mapping, the sequence qn plus 1 equals t pi of qn converges to t pi's fixed point. Let us, OK, I was supposed to live code this, but I did not really remove my code, so I'm going to live comment my code. <laughs> so let's compute the sequence qn plus 1 equals t pi of qn. Uh, let's take the policy that always moves right. So my policy is a vector of ones defined over the observation space, which I will just multiply by the index um, moving right in Frozen Lake. I will build uh, a sequence of 20 Q functions. So I'm going from Q0 to, to, to Q20. Taking gamma equals 0.9, I'm initializing Q as uh, a matrix of zeros. Uh, that's a matrix with as many lines as we have states and as many columns as we have actions. And I will store the sequence of q pi uh, in this variable q pi sequence. So um, originally, I'm just putting the 0, 1 here, which was the equivalent of q0 in my example above. And so for i in range of number of iterations, q nu is, uh, I initialize it as plain zeros everywhere, same dimension as q. And for every single state and action, I will look at the outcomes of performing action A in state X. Uh, fortunately for me, the frozen lake environment provides me with, you remember the probability, the resulting state and the resulting reward. And so I will just accumulate in Q nu of X A, the value P times R plus gamma Q of Y pi of Y. And pi of Y is really always the constant action uh, right. And once I'm done, I will just replace Q by Q nu. I will push back uh, Q in that Q pi sequence and uh, iterate uh, so as to construct the new Qn plus 1. So this is pretty straightforward to implement and to, to, to run. Let's now plot the sequence of differences between those consecutive Q functions to verify that uh, the sequence actually converges. So I will import Matplotlib so that I can actually plot. I will define a vector of residuals. The residual will be the supremum norm of the difference between Qn and Qn minus 1. And so here is how I compute it for i in range of n up to the end of the sequence. Um, sorry, this should be actually Q by sequence. Um, residuals dot append of the supremum norm of the difference between the two functions. And um, I will plot the residuals. And since I actually know what to expect, I will also plot the residuals on log scale on the y-axis. So I'm just building this. So I can see that the distance between two consecutive Q functions actually drops pretty quickly to zero. And if I plot this in logarithmic scale, I can see that this decrease is actually exponential. So this exponential decrease is actually something that was expected because t pi is a contraction mapping with a fixed contraction, contraction factor. 
Okay, so we've actually di we actually dove into the math uh, into the math pretty pretty strongly here, but on very intuitive concepts. We can actually unfold the same kind of reasoning on the value of an optimal policy. We will write that V of any optimal policy pi star is V star and Q of any pol optimal policy Q star is Q star. And um, we can just unfold the same reasonings that we had in the introductory example. We can say that a policy pi, which is defined as um, having an action in S, which maximizes Q star of SA, such a policy is an optimal policy. And since we know that, Q star will obey the same type of recurrence relation where we know that V star of S is the maximum over actions of what I get on the first step and then what, can, what I can expect to get on the long run if I apply an optimal policy from S prime. So this actually reads V star of S is max over actions of the immediate reward plus the sum over uh, states that I can reach of the probability of reaching that state times the optimal value in that state. In terms of two functions, I have exactly the same thing. It's probably a little easier to read because that first term is free because it's only dependent on the SA and the max is here inside the brackets. As for the evaluation equation, we have actually written four times the same thing in the block above, just with different functions and different notations. Uh, and we can exactly like in the case of the evaluation equation, we can define the Bellman optimality operator T star on V and Q function as the operator that maps a function to another function. Uh, and, um, and that is written like the right-hand side of those equations up there. So eventually, finding V star, respectively Q star, boils down to solving the problem V equals T star of V and Q equals T star of Q. Uh, interestingly, we have one common property between T pi and T star. Uh, T pi was linear, but because of the max operator, T star is now nonlinear, so we can't really solve that uh, through matrix inversion, for example. But we retain the contraction mapping property. Again, with gamma smaller than one, T star is a supremum norm contraction mapping over the state of, of the space of value functions. So that means that if gamma is smaller than one, then V star is the unique solution to the fixed point equation V equals T star of V. This sounds very dry and abrupt as is, but this just expresses the intuitions that we have developed in the first example, that there is a link between um, the, the optimal value in a state and the optimal value in its successors, and that the global function V star is actually a solution to that system of equations. And actually noting this um, helps us jump directly to a conclusion to, as to how can we compute Q star. And we've just seen that a policy that is greedy with respect to Q star is optimal itself. So if we can compute Q star, we can deduce an optimal policy. So we have characterized uh, an optimal policy. We know that repeatedly applying T star to an initial function Q zero yields the, sequ the sequence Qn plus one equals T star of Qn, and that sequence converges to Q star. That's the property of being a contraction mapping. The implementation of this sequence's computation is the algorithm that we call value iteration. So again, I will command the code of value iteration here. Um, I will start by stating gamma equals 0.9. I will write the sequence Qn plus one equals T star of Qn. We could do the same for Vn plus one equals T star of Vn. It's just a little easier um, for consistency to work with Q functions. So I will initialize Q as the matrix with um, as many lines as we have states, as many columns as we have actions. And the Q opt sequence, I'll just put as zero, um, zero value function in there. And exactly as before, I will iterate. Um, again, I will have 20 iterations and Q nu will be a vector of zeros. And in Q nu, I will put, I uh, will accumulate in Q nu of xA, P times R plus 
max of q in all possible actions instead of what I had before, which was uh, without the max q of y pi of y. And I will iterate. Um, so I can run this code. As before, I will plot the sequence of residuals. So this is exactly the same. Um, this is exactly the same the same code here. Um, and exactly as before, I can see a decrease, and this is actually a bit surprising, but um, but no big deal. So overall, what we can conclude from this experiment is that we have found a way to compute optimal value functions, and we know how to deduce um, optimal policies from optimal value functions. There are alternatives to the value iteration algorithm with other algorithms, such, such as ghostidal value iteration, asynchronous value iteration, policy iteration, modified policy iteration, and, and many others, for instance. Uh, we unfortunately don't have time to cover them today, but really in our goal to get familiar with notations and, and common objects in the field of reinforcement learning, it was important to go through the algorithm of value iteration and the definition of an optimal policy of the Bellman abnormality uh, operator, etc. So let's take now a step back. With the Bellman equation, we have a way to characterize Q star. This characterization directly translates to the value iteration algorithm uh, because of that contraction mapping. In turn, once we know Q star, we can deduce pi star. Okay, well, that's all very nice, but an important question is, is it applicable in practice on real world examples? In particular, an important question is, how does the computation of Q star scale with large state and action spaces? And so I will ask you to take a look at the code that was just above and tell me what the time complexity of the value iteration algorithm is in terms of S and A. And so the different options I'm suggesting here are O of SA, O of SA squared, O of S squared A, or O of S squared A squared. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna give you a bit of time to actually answer that question properly because um, this is probably one of the only tricky questions in, in this notebook. And you can probably see this is the last poll of the notebook. So let me display the, the code again. So this is the code of value iteration. Okay, let's say we take another 30 seconds here, and after that, uh, we'll go with the, with the correction. Uh, Maria, I have a, a question uh, related to, um, to to the notebook. Uh, yes. so Joh Johan um, said that he thinks a gamma is missing for computing Q nu in the dynamic programming for the optimal equation. Uh, it's possible. You are totally right. Here it should be gamma times this. You're totally right. Great, right, thank you. So, okay, this looks better. Thanks a lot. Thanks a million. Okay, so uh, let me get back to the poll. I actually agree with the majority answer. Uh, complexity of value iteration is O of S squared A. Why is that? Because, well, you just have to take the four loops in order. Uh, you have one first iteration over states, then a second one over actions. 
And then as you're iterating uh, across outcomes, you're actually iterating across potential future states again. So it's actually a sum over all possible states. So those three nested loops have actually complexity S times A times S. So um, this is a big O of S squared A. The problem is that the curse of dimensionality makes the number of states and actions scale exponentially with the dimension of the state and action spaces. So exact computation of Q star quickly becomes intractable when the dimension of the state space becomes large. Instead, what we could do is we could try to approximate the resolution of T star of QN at each step of value iteration so that the complexity remains limited because we have a limited number of parameters. This yields the approximate value iteration algorithm. Approximate value iteration is the algorithm that computes the sequence qn plus one equals a of t pi of qn, uh, sorry, of t star of qn, where a is an approximation procedure. Note in particular that when we're dealing with parametric functions q theta, uh, finding a minimizer of the loss ln of theta equals the norm of q theta minus t star of qn is such an approximation procedure because the minimizer needs not go to zero. Uh, let's suppose that A in general as an approximation procedure is not a bad approximation procedure and that its approximation error is uniformly bounded. So that is for all functions that we want to approximate in the SA to R space, the difference between the function and its approximated version in supremum norm is smaller than epsilon. And the first very important result is that approximate value iteration does not converge. Uh, so in general, when you will be uh, using reinforcement learning algorithms in real life and say, hey, I've converged to this policy, actually, uh, mathematically speaking, this is not true. However, one can prove that QN reaches actually a neighborhood of Q star, specifically that the limit of uh, where QN goes is within a certain circle, a certain bound um, in supremum norm around Q star. More importantly, what we're interested in are policies, not value functions. Let pi n be the greedy policy with respect to QN, then we can prove that Q star minus Q pi n in supremum norm is bounded by this. And consequently, as n tends to infinity, the limit when, n's to, uh, when n tends to infinity of q star minus q pi n is upper bounded by this horrible bound here, um, which when you think about it, uh, has a division by one minus gamma squared. So it's a very large value, but it's the best theoretical results we have on uh, convergence in terms of neighborhoods for the optimal, for the policy that is greedy to, with respect to the Q value of approximate value iteration. So approximate value iteration does not necessarily converge, but reaches policies whose values are close to optimal, close being a very loose definition because this upper bound is actually very large. These results can actually be proven in the neurodynamic programming book by Dmitry Bertsikas and John Tsitsiklis. Um, but when you think about them, uh, having results in supremum norm is actually very good to, to actually have results. But most supervised learning algorithm actually minimize a loss that is expressed as a weighted L2 norm, so rather a, a, a squared norm. Thus, they don't explicitly provide guarantees in supremum norm. Uh, fortunately for us, Remy Munoz provided error bounds uh, around uh, the year 2000 for approximate value iteration in the general case of weighted LP norms. So these bounds are very similar to the ones in supremum norm, and they justify the use of supervised learning techniques such as neural networks, learning from samples, for instance, in approximate value iteration. So let's wrap up this um, second big section here, and we will take a break after that. In this section, we have built upon the MDP properties of the environment we wish to control in order to characterize policies through their value functions. We have learned that Q pi is a solution to the Bellman evaluation equation, which we write Q equals T star, uh, T pi, sorry, of Q. And Q star is a solution to the Bellman optimality equation, Q equals T star of Q. Of Q. 
value iteration is the algorithm that constructs the sequence of qn plus one equals t star of qn value functions, and approximate value iteration trades exact construction of this sequence for scalability by constructing an approximate sequence qn plus one equals an approximation of t star of qn. That still provides good policies if A is a good approximation procedure. So we actually have built the second stage of our three-stage rocket. The second stage was answering the question, what is an optimal strategy? How can I characterize an optimal strategy? And we have taken a value function approach to this. Uh, and we have answered that an optimal policy is one that yields optimal cumulated rewards. It is a policy that is greedy with respect to an optimal value function Q star. And such a value function obeys Bellman's optimality equation and can be approximately computed via approximate dynamic programming, that is approximate value iteration. Okay, so second stage, we now know how to compute optimal policies. Uh, remember, the first stage was defining what an MDP was. Uh, still, we're still relying on a characterization of pi star that relies on the knowledge of the MDP, because in order to solve the optimality equation, I need to know the transition, the reward models. I need to know the rewards. I need to know the probabilities. But on the other hand, we could imagine that A is a procedure that learns QN plus one from samples of T star of QN. If such samples were obtained from interaction with the system to control, then we might have a possibility to learn Q star without knowing the MDP and instead sampling these uh, experience samples from the MDP. This is exactly what we will tackle in the final part of this notebook. I suggest we do just as before. Uh, we take a 10 minutes break until 11.50. Uh, maybe a little less if possible. Um, and in the meantime, I'm, I'm okay taking questions if there are any. So Seb, I don't know if you have any questions for me. Yeah, there are questions. Um, so they are on the Q&A. I mean, four of them, the other ones have been uh, answered by the TAs. So is in the max in the QNU formula making the complexity S squared, A squared, and not S squared? Okay, yes. So yes, in the way I've written this algorithm here, um, that is true. Um, it's just that um, this can actually be simplified. Let me put it simply. But yes, as I've written here, uh, it here it should be a square a squared. Okay, thanks. Um... Are there some good resource, some good references to the mappings? <laughs> Um, yes, topology books, I would say. <laughs> I'm definitely not an expert in general for that, but this is mainly a, a question of defined sequences and, and studying topology of function, uh, on functions. So uh, a good math maybe, textbook maybe, should help me. Maybe a, maybe a specific paper in RL that, that does that. Uh, oh. For contraction mappings in RL, then okay, then definitely uh, looking at the Potterman, so the uh, Markov decision processes book, uh, the one I quoted earlier, um, and in the Potterman, basically the the Markov decision processes book is a a theoretical book. Um, it provides proofs for every theorem that is stated there, and you will find the proof actually that T star or T pi are contraction mappings there. So if it's to study these specific contraction mappings, then definitely take a look at Martin Patterman's book. Um, okay. If it's for contraction mappings and topology in general, then I'm afraid I don't have a definitive answer there. <laughs> okay, I think RL is, is good enough for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, and there's just one remaining question, which is, can you explain a bit more on the intuition on appropriate Q value, Q value theorem and lies in the neighborhood of Q star? So, okay, sorry. Yes, this is the approximate Q value. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, I'll try to do that with my hands. So, look at me on the screen. <laughs> Basically, what happens uh, when you apply 
t star to a certain function in the function space is you move it closer to the fixed point of t star. Uh, you decrease that distance to t star. And so if you're doing standard value iteration, this distance decreases exponentially. And, um, and so you eventually reach uh, q star, at, at least asymptotically. What happens when you do approximations uh, between two applications of T star is you are breaking the contraction mapping property. You're actually not really moving to the new point that reduces the distance, but because of the approximation, you might be moving away from, T, uh, from Q star. And so in the worst case, this contraction will be compensated by a, call it a dilatation, uh, due to the approximation. This is only in the worst case. And this is why this bound is actually so large, because in the worst case, you can actually have a catastrophic um, equilibrium point, balance point, where contraction brings you inside, but you don't really know that function. You'll just have samples from it. And then you approximate it with your approximator, but your approximator is not so good. So it makes a big mistake, uh, a large error, uh, epsilon, and this moves you away from Q star. So geometrically, graphi graphically, this sort of explains why approximate value iteration does not converge but the sequence of value function eventually reaches a vicinity, a neighborhood of Q star without ever converging to Q star. I, I hope this actually brought a bit of light into th those intuitions. Thank you. Uh, simple question. In the current setup, are we assuming full knowledge of the environment, state, and action dynamics? Yes, and that is the issue. <laughs> Precisely. Um, to, to be able to compute T star of any function, uh, remember T star of a function V is going to be equal to R of S A plus gamma times the sum over next state S prime of P of S prime V of S prime. So you need to know those values for R and P. And this is what we suppose we know, which is very frustrating because what we would like to do is not know the, the model and learn, uh, instead replace the model by interaction. This is precisely what we are going to do in, um, in the next step, in the next step. Okay, and there is a final question. Uh, I don't know, do, do you want to make the break now or? Um, yeah, well, I, I, I would have assumed that people would have gone on break already. <laughs> um, but yes, I think it's a good thing to take a break. Uh, I can keep on answering questions that, as they come, but uh, let's all be back, uh, say by 11.48 in five minutes. <laughs> okay, do you want me to share the coffee break slide? Um, no, nah, don't worry. Let, let's let's leave my, my slides on. Um, okay. I, I guess everybody who's still here can uh, can hear me. Uh, okay. So I will be personally back in uh in, in five minutes. Sure. I'll be reading the Q and A. So Dinesh asks, what is the approximate function we can use in approximate value iteration? So I assume you mean approximation procedure. Um, well, actually, any procedures you like, as long as you have uh, guarantees. For example, you could sample, and this is precisely what we're going to do in the in the remainder of this notebook. You could sample your function t star of q n, uh, and then fit any regression, any regressor from supervised learning. So you could take a neural network, you could take a random forest, you could take a support vector machine, you could take a near, nearest neighbor interpolation. And um, this actually is what has been done in the reinforcement learning literature uh, when people were really uh, looking for good function approximators. So the, the answer to what is the approximate um, procedure that we can use in approximate value iteration, many of them. Uh, some papers have used random forests, for example, in a fully offline context, uh, thinking about a paper by Daniel Ernst, um, about tree-based batch, mo batch mode uh, fitted to iteration uh, that uses random forests and gets excellent results. Um, you have other papers that actually have strong convergence guarantees 
based on linear combinations of features, which is a very popular topic of research in reinforcement learning. So really any um, approximator that you actually know how to handle and provides you with guarantees. Um, I see Master Informatique 1 who's asking the question, the complexity of value iteration is said to be S squared A. I understand the SA because of the number of QSA. The further multiplication by S comes from the additions that calculate each Q of SA. Yes, that's from the sum. We're summing over um, posterior states, so next states. So this is where the, um, the second S comes from. Um, Shivani asks, what are some important theorems you'd say we should know that show up in theoretical reinforcement learning paper like simulation lemma? Okay, but basically the, the, the key theorems, but the really 101 theorems are the ones we're discussing right now. So that would be the optimal, uh, optimal policy theorem. Um, the fact that T star and T pi are contraction mappings um, and so on and so forth. Uh, beyond this, you will have um, theorems that are related to a specific function approximation. For example, if you use deep neural networks, then you will have specific um, specific theorems on the speed of convergence of, of the learning. This is a bit getting ahead of us for two reasons. First, we're gonna tackle this a little bit in the, the next part of the notebook. And it will also be partially covered by the class on DeepQ networks um, next week. So important theorems, in short, the, the most important ones are uh, the ones we've seen so far. And um, beyond that, then they're gonna be very specific to, to context for papers. What is the converged complexity of this algorithm? I assume you're talking about time complexity for convergence, and that is precisely the S square A uh, time complexity we had before, unless you're talking about the contraction factor, which is, um, which is gamma, if I remember correctly, but this should be verified in a textbook. What is the time complexity of approximate value iteration? Well, um, it depends on your approximation procedure. There is no common answer to that. It depends on the time complexity of, of A. So sorry, Bizad, I have no answer for that, unfortunately. <laughs> um, a question from Mikael. Uh, in multiple agent reinforcement learning, does the underlying MDP, is in the underlying MDP fixed since agents can adapt to each other? If no, how this can work since this is a fundamental property of everything, everything said here. Okay, multiple agent reinforcement learning is generally concerned with cooperation where you actually consider the, the swarm of agents to be one single agent that takes one action in the joint action space of all agents. And then since that problem mathematically is just too large and intractable, you try to decompose that problem into specific policies that are distributed over, across several agents. Um, overall, it implies that we are searching for policies in a space of policies that might not contain the optimal policies, uh, but that is tractable, whereas the full space of joint policies is not. So multi-agent RL is generally uh, more concerned with cooperation between agents and coordination of agents than, than, uh, than competition. So the global MDP is fixed. Uh, in multi-agent RL, and um, it's actually possible to learn with um, MDPs that vary across time. Uh, and there are lots of different research trends in those directions, but this, uh, as you've said, actually leaves the, the, the beautiful theory of, of nice MDPs as we've laid it down right now. And Anil, oh wait, I'm taking the time. Okay, last question. Anil, if possible, what properties of optimal policy may be important to look at to prevent reward hacking? 
Uh, that is a good question. Um, I'm definitely not a, an expert in, in uh, preventing attacks on, on, on policies. So uh, we'll probably take that question offline uh, to give it a bit more thought and get back to you or just write to me in the matrix chat because I just don't have an answer right now. And it's 11.50. Um, we're back to the... We're back to the notebook. So two stages of our three stages rocket have been built. Let's go on for the last one. The key idea we develop in this section is that one can actually learn the sequence of approximate value iteration functions using interaction samples rather than calculating um, that sequence using a model. Although we have introduced a fair amount of abstract concepts and mathematical notions already, it is important to keep in mind that these math simply formalize an intuitive cognitive process. And that process is that by experiencing rewards and punishments in, in real life, we humans incrementally learn to evaluate the outcomes of our actions and then decide to act accordingly. Evaluating the outcomes of our, act of our action is exactly evaluating Q star, what we can expect to get as an outcome of action A. So this cognitive, cognitive process is thus really in line with the formalism we have introduced. And we actually learn to evaluate those outcomes without writing the equations of the model down. So there should be an adaptation process that allows a machine to learn those. And that adaptation process is strongly based on the, the theory of stochastic approximation. So we will talk about policy evaluation and policy optimization as stochastic approximation procedures. And when we talk about policy evaluation as stochastic approximation, we will introduce the notion of temporal differences. Just start by recalling that evaluating Q pi of SA is estimating the mathematical expectation of G pi of SA. Stochastic approximation theory tells us that if we want to uh, estimate a mathematical expectation, for example, the mathematical expectation of G pi of SA for a given SA pair, given a series of independent realization of the random variable from which one takes the expectation, then the sequence qt plus one equals qt plus alpha t, the difference between the realization and the estimator qt, that sequence of qt, qt plus one converges to the expectation if the sequence of steps alpha t respects the robbins monroe conditions, which are that the sum of steps diverges and the sum of squared steps converges. Uh, for those who might not be totally familiar with stochastic approximation, let me put that in simpler words. Uh, we can understand the previous update as follows. Those GT pi are sample estimates of the expectation of G pi of SA because there are independent realizations of the random variable inside the expectation here. So if I already have an estimate QT of my expectation and I receive a new sample GT pi at time T, then that sample tells me I should pull my previous estimate QT towards that new sample GT pi. But GT pi also carries a part of the noise. So I should be cautious and only take a small step alpha in the direction of GT pi. So that's basically doing uh, performing a gradient step. In turn, the convergence conditions, uh, the Ramitz Monroe con convergence conditions, simply state that any initial value, uh, sorry, any value Q pi of SA should be reachable from any initial gaze Q of SA. So that the accumulated number of steps uh, should go to, to plus infinity, uh, no matter how far Q pi of SA is from this first guess. Uh, this justifies the sum of steps diverges. And however, we still need the step size to be decreasing 
so that we don't start oscillating around q pi of s, say, when we get closer. So to ensure convergence, we impose that the sum of squared is actually convergent. So this is an intuitive explanation behind stochastic approximation. So basically, this principle of stochastic approximation provides us with a way to estimate q pi of s a from experience samples rather than from a model. How do we do that? Well, we do that by obtaining independent realizations g pi of s a of the random variable g pi of s a in all s a pairs. And as, as we obtain those realizations, we can perform stochastic approximation updates of Q under the form Q of SA receives Q of SA plus that little shift towards G pi of SA, so alpha times G pi of SA minus Q of SA. And if alpha respects the robbins monroe conditions, then Q will converge to Q pi. A slightly more modern formulation of stochastic approximation is actually stochastic gradient descent, which you might have already come across in your studies before. So we will slightly generalize the formulation above. Um, Q pi is actually the function that minimizes a loss on functions, which is the L2 norm of Q minus that expectation. Uh, and that should be true in all SA pairs. Recall now that in the most general case, Q is a function um, and we're minimizing across functions. So that's an infinite dimensional space. Um, but for the sake of clarity, we will momentarily suppose that SA is finite. And then that space of functions is just the space of, of tables. It's a finite dimensional space. It's the space of tables where you have as many values in a table as you have pairs of states and actions. And so Q is equivalent to the vector of all Q of SA values. Then minimizing LQ can be done via gradient descent in a finite dimension. Uh, you take the gradient with respect to all the components of Q of LQ. And this gradient uh, can be written as the integral over SA of the derivative of what was that loss here. So the difference between Q of SA and the expected value times the gradient with respect to Q of Q, uh, dsda. Suppose now that we have a set of independently drawn states and action. Uh, I will call them SI and AI. Then this gradient can be approximated via a Monte Carlo estimator. This Monte Carlo estimator is uh, just the replacement of this integral by a sum provided that those S, I, A, I are drawn according to a proper um, probability distribution function. In our example, where Q is the vector of values taken in each state and action, then the gradient with respect to Q of Q in S, I, A, I is actually a vector with zeros everywhere and just a one corresponding to the position of SI and AI. So um, that was just a remark. So exactly the same way as for stochastic approximation, if we can obtain those independent realizations, G pi of SI AI of the random variable, G pi of SI AI, then we can estimate this gradient as uh, a descent direction D, which is the sum, uh, over a certain number of samples of the difference between Q of SIEI and the realization of the random variable G pi of SIEI times the gradient with respect to Q of Q. And thus we have the stochastic gradient descent update where Q is updated by uh, applying minus alpha times the gradient to it. This update mechanism yields a sequence QT of value function that converges to Q pi if the gradient steps also respect Robbins Monroe conditions. So basically, uh, stochastic gradient descent is just a generalization of stochastic approximation. And here comes the green box, the main result here. If we can obtain independent realizations G pi SA of the random variable G pi of SA in all possible SA pairs, then we can perform stochastic gradient descent updates on the Q function, and then Q converges to Q pi. So just note that if n equals one in the update above, then we just fall back to the stochastic approximation update. Having a sample in SI AI only updates the, um, the Q value in SI AI. 
for the sake of simplicity, of notation simplicity, we will work and we'll keep the stochastic approximation perspective and notations in the rest of this exercise. But for everything we're going to say uh, after this, the transition to SGD is actually straightforward. So overall, the conclusion here is that if we manage to draw independent samples G pi of SI, uh, sorry, the AI is missing here, uh, in all states in action, then we can learn the value function or the Q function of policy pi. And so the question is, can we actually obtain those samples? So let's just remember, G pi of S is the random variable that tells me from S or from S and A, here is the, the sum of rewards I can expect. Consider now the sample S, A, R, S prime, or S, T, A, T, R, T, S, T plus one, obtained at time T. As soon as this sample is acquired, so as soon as the transition is over, we have reached S, T plus one, we can actually update our knowledge of Q of S, T, A, T by using R, uh, so this RT plus gamma Q of ST plus one pi of ST plus one as a, a, a target G pi of SIAI of F, sorry, STAT in this case. This estimate uses the function Q to bootstrap the estimator of Q of STAT. So, and just a note here, this bootstrap operation has absolutely nothing to do with the statistical procedure of bootstrapping. It's really bootstrapping like in putting a, a shoelace at the end of another shoelace. So it's really putting a value at the end of a trajectory. So this idea of bootstrapping was first introduced in the seminal paper of Rich Sutton's learning to predict by the method of temporal differences. And it has a very strong parallel with the evaluation equation. Remember the evaluation equation, it was Q pi of SA is equal to the expectation over S prime of the reward I get on the first step plus gamma times whatever I will get by applying pi in the long run starting in S prime. The key remark is that the sample G pi T obtained at time step T of Q pi of STAT can be built by summing RT, which is a realization of the first part uh, here, and gamma QT of ST plus one pi of ST plus one. So this is my realization GT. And in the expression above, I have specifically stressed the fact that we use QT and uh, not another Q, Q value to emphasize the fact that we use the Q function as it is at time steps T to define the target GT pi used in the update that will provide QT plus one. So even though this is a bit um, clumsy in terms of notation and might actually be a bit heavy, uh, it is pretty straightforward and intuitive. Formally, this comes directly from the evaluation operator. If we were write T pi in terms of random variable, T pi of a function Q applied in SA is the expectation over rewards and next states of the reward plus gamma times Q applied in the next state. And since Q pi is a fixed point of T pi, by taking such samples GT equals RT plus gamma, what I get from ST plus one, basically I'm applying T pi and then taking one stochastic approximation step in the direction of T pi of QT. And then I will iterate. I will reapply T pi and take one other stochastic approximation step in the direction of T pi of QT and so on and so forth. So bootstrapping in this particular context is really the operation of just using the value of QT in the update of Q. Then um, this update that we've been talking about for the last two minutes is called the TD zero update, TD for temporal difference. So it is the update that says Q of STAT is replaced by Q of STAT plus alpha. This realization that is bootstrapped, so RT plus gamma S of ST plus one pi of ST plus one minus Q of STAT. So the difference between that G, which is the big thing here, uh, and the Q of STAT value that we defined earlier. So this update really consists in taking one stochastic approximation step in the direction of T pi of V every time a sample comes in. And the SGD update is almost the same, it just involves a sum here. 
let's insist on this point. TD0, the algorithm that we've written here, does not directly solve Q is the expected sum of rewards. This is actually what other methods that we call Monte Carlo methods do. TD0, what it does is it implements stochastic approximation on top of the repeated application of the TPI operator. So we really apply TPI on Q and then sample from this TPI of Q gets a realization G, uh, which is the sum of R plus the bootstrap and take one stochastic approximation step in that direction. And so that provides me with a new uh, Q and I'm gonna take a new um, TPI application and so on. So really what TD0 solves is QN plus one equals T pi of QN, not Q equals sum of rewards. At each time step T, it takes the current value function QT, draws one or several samples from T pi QT and approximate T pi of QT by taking one step of gradient descent or one step of stochastic approximation from QT. So this is actually something I really insist on uh, because this is what makes temporal difference methods powerful. The difference uh, between RT plus gamma QT in S prime minus uh, QT in S and A is what we call a prediction temporal difference, which is what gives its name to the algorithm. Um, it is the difference between our estimate QT of STAT before uh, observing the transition and obtaining the information of R and ST plus one and the bootstrap value after observing the transition, which is RT plus gamma QT of ST plus one, pi of ST plus one. So in short notations, that temporal difference delta is written R plus gamma Q of S prime, pi of S prime minus Q of SA. So now it seems kind of obvious that if a, some state actions pair SA is never visited by the sampling, uh, so if we never have a single, a specific SA pair among our samples, then there will never be any update of Q of SA because there will never be any temporal difference. Therefore, the TD0 update, uh, if we want the TD0 update to converge, we need to guarantee that all state action pairs will be visited frequently enough for Q to converge to Q pi and frequently enough basically means infinitely often as time passes. So the full TD0 algorithm on Q function can be written the following way. For a given sample S A R S prime, the temporal difference is R plus gamma uh, Q of S prime pi of S prime minus Q of S A. So the difference of what I believe after I observe and before. And Q of SA is updated according to the TD update, which is Q of SA receives Q of SA plus alpha delta. And this will actually converge as long as all state actions pairs SA are sampled infinitely often as T goes to infinity and under the Robinson Monroe conditions. Interestingly, this algorithm actually puts restrictions on the policy that we should apply when we're interacting with the environment, because that's the policy that will provide us with these S A R S prime samples. So we will call such a policy a behavior policy, and this keyword will actually come back regularly uh, in the classes. Not only this one, like most classes of our LDS. The behavior policy and the policy being learned might actually be different. In the case of TD0, this is even an obligation since we need to enforce the visits to all state actions pairs while we're evaluating a single policy. So we're just introducing a bit of vocabulary here. I'm not gonna insist on this, but I would like you to have this vocabulary written somewhere. Off policy evaluation algorithms are actually algorithms that manage to use a different behavior policy than the one that they actually evaluate. So this is precisely the case for TD0. So let's try to implement TD0 on Q functions. I know this cell takes a while to run, so I'll just start it now and explain what it is. So to ensure that all states and actions are sampled infinitely often, we take a behavior policy that acts randomly in each state. We will take gamma equals 0.9, and we'll run the algorithm for, uh, well, not 2 million, but 1 million time steps. So to keep things simple, we'll 
we're going to take a constant alpha equals 10 to the minus 2. So this does not respect the Roberts Monroe conditions, and we will tolerate a bit of, of um, non convergence or convergence to a, a, a vicinity of the optimal solution. So gamma equals 0.9, alpha equals 0.1, max steps equals 1 million. QTD, so the, the value I'm learning, I'm initializing it as usual as a matrix, S uh, lines and A columns. And just for comparison, I will recall Q true as the policy we had converged when we still were using the model for evaluating Q pi. So the last one in the sequence of, of the evaluation equation. I will monitor the error we make between QTD and Q true after each step. So I will initialize this error vector with max steps elements. I'll reset the environment. And for every time step of interaction, I will randomly draw an action because we said that the behavior policy is fully random, uniformly random over actions. I will take a step. So I obtain this S A R uh, S prime sample. So here I wrote S equals X and S prime equals Y. And I've just performed the TD update. QTD of SA equals Q of SA plus alpha times the temporal difference. So the temporal difference is R plus gamma QTD of Y and the policy that moves right, because I'm evaluating this policy, minus QTD of XA. And once I've performed this update, I just compute my error, which is the maximum, the supremum norm of QTD minus Q true. If I've if I've fallen into a hole, I just reset the environment and restart. Otherwise, I just move on to the next state. So uh, while I was talking, the computation is finished. I will just plot the maximum error we make after uh, after learning. Uh, so this is in the order of seven. Uh, of 10 to the minus 2. And here is the plot of the error decreasing between Q true, which was computed with the model, um, and the Q that is actually computed with TD0. So we're converging to a decent approximation of Q pi. There are many improvements uh, when computing um, stochastic approximation or stochastic gradient descent updates on, on Q functions. I'm definitely not going to present them now. Um, what I want you to remember here is that we actually were able to solve the evaluation equation without resorting to the model, and we have actually replaced the model by sampling and by using stochastic approximation as a way to approximate the expectation of cumulated long-term rewards replace that with samples. And these samples, we've actually defined them as being bootstrapped samples for one step. Actually, what we've done for the evaluation equation, we can do the exact same thing for the uh, optimality equation. So this boils down in the end to uh, performing stochastic approximation on approximate value iteration. And this brings us to maybe the most famous algorithm in reinforcement learning. This brings us to Q-learning. We can directly adapt the idea of temporal difference learning to the approximate value iteration case. And I'm just going to jump to conclusions there because we've already seen all that. In the approximate value iteration case, we don't want to learn T pi of QT. We want to learn T star of QT. So our samples are going to be the immediate reward plus gamma times max over a, a prime of QT of ST plus one A prime. And immediately we find out that the learning algorithm, the, the temporal difference learning algorithm becomes the famous Q-learning algorithms as introduced by Chris Watkins in 1989. Q-learning works the following way for a sample S A R S prime. The temporal difference is R plus gamma max over S prime of Q of S prime A prime minus the previous estimation Q of S A. And the TD update, as usual, is Q of S A receives Q of S A plus alpha delta. As long as all the state action pairs, again, are visited infinitely often 
as t tends to infinity, and as long as we respect the Robbins Monroe condition, this procedure is guaranteed to convert to Q star. An interesting thing here is what is hidden in this um, sketch of algorithm. To implement a Q-learning algorithm, one actually needs to decide on a behavior policy. This behavior policy should ensure that all state action pairs are sampled infinitely often as T goes to infinity. But also, uh, it's interesting to see that as for TD0, Q learning will converge to Q star. Um, in whatever the, the sampling is, as long as we respect that condition. So it is actually notable that Q converges to Q star, even if the behavior policy does not. But it also looks like a waste of computational resources to keep exploring uniformly or very naively around the starting state. And this is the final main concept I would like to convey to you during this class. This trade-off between exploring new actions in a very naive, expensive way, and exploiting what has already been learned, what has already been inferred in Q uh, to, to, to uh, give some advantage to states and action that seem promising, that is called the exploration versus exploitation trade-off. It is a crucial fundamental problem in reinforcement learning that strongly affects the ability of the algorithm to discover new interesting rewards and learn uh, about these interesting rewards. Um, a full day, as I had the occasion to say earlier, the, a full day in RLVS is dedicated to the exploration versus exploitation trade-off. And here we will implement a rather naive trade-off strategy called an epsilon greedy behavior. It consists basically in picking and picking the Q greedy action with probability one minus epsilon and a random action with probability epsilon. Epsilon will initially start at once and periodically we will divide epsilon by two so that the behavior policy eventually tends to a fully greedy behavior uh, and refines the knowledge of Q of SA around the optimal trajectories. So let's take a look at what the code looks like for Q learning now. Uh, um, I just started by writing a function that picks an epsilon greedy action. Uh, so this function takes a Q value, a Q function and a state and the parameter epsilon as inputs. It will compute the argmax of uh, over Q so that there's the greedy action. And if a random draw is smaller than epsilon, it will draw a random action different than the greedy action itself. Uh, otherwise, it will just return the greedy action. So this is just a utility function here, and we'll, we will write the Q learning, Q learning algorithm now. Um, we will try to keep track uh, more than the error itself with respect to Q star, we will keep track of the number of times each state action pair is visited to actually try to illustrate this exploration problem in reinforcement learning. So here is what the algorithm does. Um, the QQL uh, is the function that I will learn. We initialize it by taking the last Q pi from what I had learned, so that convergence is a bit faster. We will perform uh, 2 million steps of interaction, and we will store in that count matrix the number of times that we have actually visited a state, state action pairs. Um, we take epsilon equals one, we reset the environment, and for the full span of interaction time step, every million uh, time step, we divide epsilon by two. So epsilon is not going to be that small at the end. Uh, we pick an action that is epsilon greedy. We perform a step. We compute the temporal difference, which is here and perform the temporal difference update on the Q function. Increment count of XA uh, to remember that we actually went through that sample. And if we have fallen to a hole, we reset the environment. Otherwise, we just keep moving. And uh, we will print uh, Q learning's final value function and policy um, as soon as this ends. Uh, 
And I can take a quick look at the Q&A while this is running. So there's a question saying when max is applied. Okay, sorry, I'll take the questions later. It has finished running. So this is the maximum error. I will display in priority the visitation frequency and the policy for frozen lake that has been found. So visitation frequencies are displayed in colors for all actions. So obviously there is no visitation frequency in holes because we don't record those. Uh, but it seems that exploration was intense around the starting point and a lot scarcer in um, closer to the goal. Um, this is mainly because we have this very naive vessel and greedy exploration policy. And um, for some reason, no, well, I, I want to plot the final policy. So I'll just define a function that outputs a greedy policy um, and prints it. So please trust me on the details here. I'll just display that optimal or at least quasi-optimal policy found by Q-learning on the, on the frozen lake example. Okay, um, we've been together for almost three hours. I can feel, I suppose you are tired. So we are going to summarize and, uh, and try to wrap everything up. So previous sections had shown how to characterize and find optimal policies given the MDP model. We in this section have built on the results of approximate value iteration, approximate dynamic programming to learn optimal value functions from interaction samples instead of calculating them. So we have built the third stage of our three stages rocket because our third question originally was, how do we learn an optimal strategy? Well, to learn an optimal strategy, we rely on a stochastic approximation of Q star given samples drawn from the MDP. This stochastic approximation of Q star is actually a stochastic approximation of the QN sequence of approximate value iteration. So in the end, we need to find good approximation or architectures and to control the exploration versus exploitation trade-off because what we're really doing is uh, we're doing approximate value iteration, so we need good approximators, and we're doing interaction and sampling from the system uh, via stochastic approximation, so we need a good exploration versus exploitation trade-off. Okay, we have reached almost the end of this class, and I will just recall the full contents um, of the class so that you actually see all the steps we have gone through. Uh, let me put it back on the side. So we started by stating the class goals, giving a very general abstract definition of RL, uh, RL being concerned with learning um, control strategies or control behaviors for um, systems, uh, for, for discrete time systems. Uh, we situated RL within machine learning. We uh, gently and intuitively tried to move from a concrete example towards a general model for uh, describing the problems we want to control. And then we introduced the mark of decision processes framework and its key properties, uh, the criteria, the policies. Then we said, okay, well now I want to exploit those properties to characterize optimality, which led us to the optimality equation. In turn, it led us to value iteration and approximate value iteration. And finally, we said, okay, now we want to solve this process of value iteration and approximate value iteration, but without knowing the, the model, and I will replace that with sampling from the environment. This sampling eventually is made through a, an exploration versus exploitation trade-off, and it feeds the samples to a stochastic approximation procedure. Let's now wrap it all up. Um, why did this move up? General summary of what we have learned in this class as we are reaching the end of it. Uh, reinforcement learning is the discipline that studies the learning process of optimal control policies in the MDP framework. It roots, its roots overlap 
cognitive psychology, control theory, artificial intelligence, machine learning. We're at the intersection of those fields. We have uh, explored the vocabulary and the objects that we actually manipulate on an everyday basis in reinforcement learning. This vocabulary and objects have led us to define markup decision processes, policies, value functions. Um, by building on the framework of markup decision processes, reinforcement learning draws from the characterization of optimal policies uh, that maximize a given criterion, notably through Bellman's equations. We will see in a minute that Bellman's equations might be dispensable. And eventually, reinforcement learning performs the learning part by doing stochastic approximation or stochastic gradient descent to find solutions to the Bellman equations using interaction samples. So, of course, in three hours, we have barely touched the surface of RL and the theory behind. But what I really wanted is for you to manipulate uh, along those three hours uh, the concepts <clears throat> that we play with <clears throat> on an everyday basis in RL. Some methods that you will come across during RLVS do not even rely on the Bellman equations. Some others rely on the Bellman equations, but don't use value iteration, for instance. We can't cover it all in three hours, but what we have covered is really the building blocks and the building mechanisms um, and, and main concepts around reinforcement learning, which was our goal in an, intro an introduction to reinforcement learning, uh, learning fundamentals. Now let's move on to what are really the, the challenges and the problems in reinforcement learning. And we will try to relate those with the upcoming classes in RLVS. So many topics covered in this class would actually deserve a more in-depth coverage uh, themselves. But we can already identify three challenges that make the reinforcement learning problem intrinsically difficult or that are proper to the reinforcement learning problem. Those three challenges are function approximation, the exploration versus exploitation trade-off, and the improvement problem. The two first ones, you probably have intuitions about them now because we've encountered them on the course of this, of this notebook. Let's take the three of them in order. As we have seen, function approximation is key in finding good policies. Although it needs not be tackled necessarily with stochastic gradient descent, the interplay between deep learning and reinforcement learning in recent years has triggered major advances in reinforcement learning. This is why one full day of our LVS is dedicated to this question of function approximation with deep neural networks. So the classes on April 1st about deep Q networks and its variants will actually dive deeper into how one can uh, implement approximate value iteration with deep neural networks and what are really the associated optimization problems and optimization landscapes. On that topic of optimization landscapes, that is why the particular focus will be given to regularize MDPs uh, to bring a new perspective to approximate dynamic programming. Concerning the second challenge, behavior policies are really a cornerstone of reinforcement learning. Which action should one take to obtain informative samples? Should one explore uniformly the environment or rather follow a policy that takes the system towards promising states before exploring more aggressively? All these questions are actually the trade-off between exploration and exploitation. The classes tomorrow on March 26th about stochastic banded algorithms and then Monte Carlo tree search will explore this aspect more in depth and in a principled way, trying to reach sample efficiency. They will be complemented by the exploration and deep reinforcement learning class on April 2nd, which will actually couple function approximation and exploration versus exploitation trade-off. Finally, concerning the third challenge, which we haven't so much developed in this class, the ideas we developed here relied on estimating value functions to deduce greedy policies. Finding such greedy policies was actually made easy because actions were discrete in the examples that we actually tackled. But finding improving actions or improving policies is actually a challenge in itself. This problem is present 
both when one searches for a greedy action with respect to Q, like in Q learning or in value iteration, but also when one aims at directly solving the max over policies of JPy problem without going through the proxy of up to the optimality equation, so without going through value functions. The classes on April 2nd will actually cover the question of gradient-based policy search methods, specifically policy gradient methods. And conversely, the morning of April 8th will cover gradient-free methods, mainly evolutionary reinforcement learning methods, and how evolving agents can learn more like animals and like biological processes, and how this is an actually an efficient way of solving the reinforcement learning problem. So these three key challenges now, uh, I hope you can see that these key, three key challenges have actually been uh, fundamental in structuring how RLVS is organized and how the classes and days follow a specific challenge and question every time. Let's now take a look at specific other questions and challenges in reinforcement learning. Because beyond these three intrinsic challenges, and this taxonomy which I'm giving could definitely be challenged, um, but beyond these three intrinsic challenges, there are countless context-dependent open questions in reinforcement learning. Like, can one define and exploit temporal abstractions in the form of macro actions in reinforcement learning? This will actually be covered tonight, uh, for the last talk of the day, in the Introduction to Hierarchical Reinforcement Learning class by Doina Aprika. What connection can we draw between human preferences and formal reward models for better reinforcement learning? This is the topic of the reward processing biases in humans and reinforcement learning agents, uh, which is the keynote by Irina Rich this afternoon. Uh, how can one leverage prior knowledge about the system uh, to control in, in order to learn faster and to obtain more meaningful policies? And this prior knowledge can be in the form of uh, models of the, of the system or samples coming from a similar system or hypothesis on the shape of the value function. And what is the interplay then between introducing this prior knowledge um, and, this, and, uh, and the learning part? So what is the interplay between learning and reasoning? And so the three talks about micro data policy search, symbolic representations and reinforcement learning, and the leveraging model learning for extreme generalization classes that are kind of scattered around uh, our LVS, um, are in line with those questions of leveraging different aspects of knowledge in order to obtain better reinforcement learning. Another important question is uh, for people who have practical uh, reinforcement learning things to implement is, what are the obstacles that arise when we actually apply reinforcement learning to real world systems? And so the full classes on the multi-arm bandit and critical trials and the efficient motor skills learning in robotics uh, the keynotes there will actually address these problems and we'll go even more in depth with Antonin Rafa's class on April 9th about reinforcement learning tips and tricks, which will take us all the way through the development and usage of a comprehensive reinforcement learning library. So this coverage of challenges and questions is really meant to give you anchor points so that you know a little better now how to navigate in the reinforcement learning literature and how to navigate in RLVS. Among the topics that RLVS will not cover, but that would deserve to be mentioned here, uh, we have an incomplete list here because there are just so many of them, I just could not list them all. But we can mention multi-agent reinforcement learning, partially observable MDPs, robust reinforcement learning, including domain adaptation and reinforcement learning, offline RL, consolidation and transfer in RL, causal RL, and many, many, many more. Um, so I will just conclude this presentation by um, the simple welcome fact. Um, I have the honor and privilege to welcome you to the field of reinforcement learning. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much for your uh, introductory uh, class, Emmanuel. Um, do you want to take some uh, further questions? Sure, I think we do have a bit of time for that. Yeah. So oh, if you can look questions. at the, sorry? 
Uh, there are 10 open questions. I have just seen that now. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we can just, uh, so there are some amazing class. Thank you. Many thanks for a great presentation in, in, the, in the questions. <laughs> I'm happy you appreciate it. <laughs> so first question is in the TD equation. Uh, oh, sorry, the thing is moving. Okay, I have it. We could have simply, oh, wait, it's moving for me too. <laughs> we could have simply written the bootstrap term with V instead of Q. Um, okay, let's get back to the TD equation. Um, so policy evaluation and stochastic approximation. Um, let's take that, this one here. So yes, we could have used V here instead of Q in place of Q of S prime, pi of S prime. But the thing is, if we were using V in practical terms, that means in memory, in the computer, we are storing both a Q function and a V function. If I have a Q function and I know my policy, then I have a way to, to actually directly find the V function. So it, your, your question, uh, your remark is correct. Uh, Q of S prime pi of S prime actually stands for V of S prime. But really, um, what, what we're interested in learning right now is only Q, and we don't want to bother learning both Q and V at the same time, although it is something that could be done. So um, in the TD equation, we could have written the bootstrap term with V instead of Q. It is true. Uh, but it would have kind of defeated the purpose of learning Q. OK. Uh, so there are different types of questions, actually. So there are. Uh, under, you know, there are questions about references. There are questions about understanding things. So maybe the understanding, the first question at the top. So when max of Q S prime and prime is applied in the update, it converts to Q star, no matter what the behavior policy. Uh, but what if we apply some over F of Q S prime and prime? Will we oh, instead of max of Q S prime and prime? I guess so. Okay, that is a very good question. Are there other operators than the max operators for which we can define an optimal um, an optimal an optimality equation? Um, so the answer is yes, there are. There is actually a really interesting work by Shabash um, I think at the turn of the century. Um, uh, about uh, defining alternate maximization operators. This work still has uh, follow-ups now, especially I'm thinking about the mellow max operator that was introduced, I think, two years ago. Um, that, it, that looks pretty much like a soft max, for example. And you can actually define an optimality equation and try to solve that optimality equation via stochastic approximation. Uh, it's not necessarily always straightforward, but yes, it is doable. And your question is actually very well formulated because the question is actually, where will we converge then? To what are we going to converge? Well, we are going to converge to the fixed point, or to a vicinity of the fixed point of that new Bellman equation for that new maximization operator. Um, but that really depends on, on the maximization operator itself. And so on the properties we expect from it. So I, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> How can we add the epsilon hyperparameter to the Bellman equation? Excellent question. Actually, I was not expecting this one. Actually, um, suppose that um, we don't want to learn the optimal policies value function, like in Q-learning, suppose that we want to learn the value function of the behavior policy. So basically, the pol behavior policy includes the exploration, it includes the epsilon hyperparameter. Then we can actually run a TD0 algorithm to learn that value function. And slowly, we can make the epsilon hyperparameter go to zero uh, and make the policy greedy with respect to what we have learned. Uh, interestingly, this algorithm has a name. It's called SARSA. It's an algorithm that smoothly uh, takes epsilon to zero. And uh, instead of trying to approximate the value of the optimal policy, 
it constantly tries to approximate the value of the current behavior policy. And it makes the behavior policy slowly greedy with respect to Q, and Q tries to, to track uh, that new policy. And those two processes interact pretty nicely. Um, and SARSA is, is sort of the twin of Q learning when we talk about um, stochastic approximations for, for uh, Bellman equations. I just didn't have time to cover it now. But uh, how can we add the epsilon hyperparameter to the Bellman equation? But well, directly by learning the Q pi of the behavior policy. So that's the answer in one sentence. There exists results in the literature that prove convergence of tabular Q learning with changing sign reward function in the, in the case where not all policies are proper. Okay, this is an expert question. <laughs> um, let me take that question uh, offline to matrix. The, because the answer is yes, but in restricted cases, and um, I'm not sure we it's worth answering that publicly for everybody right now. Yeah, it's a good idea to forward some questions on the matrix. Yeah. So epsilon has been divided only once in the loop. Yes, actually, yes. Well, actually, it has been divided a second time, but only on the very last time step. So this is cheating. So you're right. It has been divided only once in the loop. Uh, you're not missing something. Uh, and it's just that uh, like purely uniform random exploration in Frozen Lake is actually enough to reasonably explore the, the environment. And it was uh, providing eventually enough samples for Q learning to learn. So the behavior policy is still pretty much random because um, one chance out of two, it actually picks a random action. But the but the Q the, the Q value itself is really close to the optimal Q value. This is the interesting feature of Q learning. It learns the optimal uh, value function while it's applying any policy, as long as this policy visits all states and actions. The reference to stochastic approximation was very helpful to understand more. Can you please point to some resource? Uh, well, OK, if you're curious about historical origins, I would definitely recommend reading the uh, Robbins Monroe paper. It's an article. Uh, so if you if you take a look at the Wikipedia page, it's a, it's a 1951 or three article, I think. And it's publicly available on the internet. Otherwise, if you want to understand more about the dynamics, like what's going on in the optimization process in stochastic approximation, I would not recommend going towards stochastic approximation today. I would recommend really going towards uh, stochastic gradient descent and recent work and textbooks on stochastic gradient descent, either on the mathematical side or on the machine learning side. And on the machine learning side, definitely, I think a good reference is the deep learning book the book that is called Deep Learning by um, Goodfellow, Bengio, and Corville. Uh, I have a question related to deep reinforcement learning. How can we quantify the generalization of deep reinforcement learning agents? Um, okay, the, the short answer is we cannot. Um, and that is an issue. Um, because it's really hard to quantify the generalization of a deep neural network in, in, without further hypothesis. There have been different approaches at tackling this problem. It mainly also depends on what you mean by generalization. If you mean it in a uh, statistical learning uh, sense, so a notion of proximity between states uh, and validity of a policy in general, well, then we have the same problem as deep learning in general, and it's that it's hard to actually understand the underlying metric that is incurred by a, a that is provoked, say, by a, a deep neural network on the input data. Uh, if you talk about generalization across different MDPs, then that is not a statistical learning problem, that is a problem of robustness. But uh, sometimes people actually get those two notions mixed up, which is, I guess, legitimate, uh, because, um, well, generalization can be understood uh, in many different ways. 
And that question of how can we quantify the generalization of deep reinforcement learning agents in terms of robustness, for example, to model uncertainties or to observation uncertainties, this can actually be quantified, say, empirically. Um, but in terms of a general theory, um, I could point you towards recent papers in the literature that attempt to do this, but there is no common accepted general big result that solves the question of generalization of deep reinforcement learning agents, at least to the best of my knowledge. Which industry will reinforcement learning revolutionize the most? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm totally unable to answer the question. <laughs> I think uh, whichever industry you want to move into, <laughs> I don't think, uh, I think this is an ill post problem. Um, reinforcement learning hasn't changed so much fundamentally um, recently. It has been coupled with deep reinforcement learning, uh, with deep learning, uh, and there are lots of people working on it now. Everybody's expecting big advances from AI without really looking into the technical details. I don't think there is a specific industry that will be more affected by reinforcement learning than another one. Is there any method to calculate constant step size alpha? I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, oh, to, to decide on a specific value for the step size alpha? Um, Okay, short answer is no, but this is exact same problem as fixing the learning rate in a deep learning problem. You're minimizing a function, you're taking steps, uh, your gradients are noisy because they are Monte Carlo estimates of a, a gradient. Um, and those steps, if you really want to follow the theory, they should respect the Robbins Monroe conditions or an alternate version called the Kiefer Wolfowitz conditions. Um, uh, on the steps, but those are pretty mild condition as we've seen. And in practice, everybody takes constant uh, step sizes because we tolerate reaching a, a, a proximity, a neighborhood of the optimal solution and then oscillating around it is not so bad. Um, also in reinforcement learning, just as in supervised learning, there are uh, methods that try to adapt the learning rate or the or the descent directions. Um, like for example, people use Adam, so uh, um, uh, and other methods that use Nesterov inertia, for example, uh, in optimization for machine learning. But this is the exact same problem as in deep learning. So no specific reinforcement learning answer to your question. Sorry. Trying to improve another policy from a behavior policy seems similar to offline learning. Are challenges for convergence accuracy approximation similar? Okay, so there are actually two things in your question. Uh, improve one policy, um, oh no, wait, from a behavior policy. Sorry, I didn't understand it at first. Um, yes, it seems similar to offline learning. Um, there is one issue that I, absolutely haven't tackled during this class, which is the problem of offline, of, of policy, sorry, of, of policy learning. Um, the distribution of samples that we actually obtain um, has two very annoying characteristics. Uh, the first one is it's conditioned by the current policy. And so if the current policy doesn't explore the full state action space, well, we're gonna have uncovered parts of the state action space which might be problematic because we don't want to generalize a policy to some part of the state action space where we have never seen a sample. And the second one is that the distribution of samples in the sample set that we will build if we keep samples in memory, this distribution very strongly affects the loss that we are minimizing. And there is no common solution uh, for, for that right now. So, so your question actually mixes uh, a part of off policy uh, learning, and obviously you need off policy learning to do offline learning because if you or do offline learning, you don't have the possibility to interact with the system anymore. Um, and so, I don't remember exactly all the details in the question. I think we have uh, marked it as solved. But uh, so again, sorry. Many answers in reinforcement learning would pretty much look like the one I'm giving. The ones I'm giving now is like there are 
trends and ideas um, to consider the problems that you, you, you're asking about, but there often is not a definitive answer. Um, Rafael, yes, videos will be available online after the class. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, it's all in the FAQ. Uh, yeah, um, many. I'm just uh, going to make a super short uh, demo at the very end, uh, just to, to show the FAQ and things like that, because I've, we, have, we have had so many questions about that. So yeah, maybe no you can take a few more questions and, uh, and then I'll do that. Sure, no problem. Don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, okay. I could answer questions on Matrix. I'll just maybe pick a couple of questions now. Um, yeah, sure. Can reinforcement learning be described as an approach to adaptive optimal control of nonlinear systems? Absolutely. Um, and it is actually one of the big promises of reinforcement learning in robotics. Um, so, so yes, it is sample hungry. It's terrible in terms of sample efficiency right now, but for nonlinear systems, it's actually a very decent competitor to, um, to approaches in classical control theory. Uh, and the question by Charu is the TD zero learning method trying to evaluate the behavior policy rather than learning the value of the optimal policy. Yes, TD0 is trying to evaluate a policy, the policy that you actually yeah, see here, that the policy to actually plug here in the equation. So TD0 will evaluate the Q value, the Q pi of this policy pi here. So, uh, so it's not learning the optimal policy. Q learning is actually learning the optimal policy, but it's not plugging Q pi here. It's plugging, plugging a max over actions of Q of S prime A prime, which makes all the difference. And I believe we have gone through all questions. I saw earlier that there was a question from Sandrine, but I guess I'll answer that on Matrix. Again, I thank you all very much for your attention and your patience. Um, I hope this was profitable and efficient for you and enjoyable. And I'm really looking forward to all the great talks we're going to have uh, in, in our LDS.